Hello and welcome to the Sensibly Speaking Podcast. This is Chris Shelton, the critical thinker at large, coming at you on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and with video here on YouTube. All right, folks, this week we are going to have another episode of Podcasting Greatness. I am um, very, very happy to finally be tackling this issue. I have been asked about this woman for literally years. I have had people writing me emails, asking me about Teal Swan, is she a cult leader, is she a this, is she a that, and I've always just sort of looked at some of her videos. I went over to her channel a couple of, a couple of years ago, checked out a couple of her videos, and was like, okay, that's a, a, a step into an, another dimension. And just kind of bounced right out of it because I didn't want to, I, I didn't have the time, at, you know, to, to do a deep dive into figuring what Teal Swan is all about. Um, but clearly her videos are odd, if, uh, if nothing else. So what happened now is I have the opportunity to um, interview somebody who was actually connected with and very involved in, all in, uh, with Teal Swan's group, the Teal Tribe, and there's Teal this and Teal that. You can find various Facebook groups, and you can find, you know, people talking about her and claiming to be, um, you know, followers of hers. Um, she first came out, and and I'm not pretending to have done a deep research dive here, but I'm going to give you a couple broad details, so kind of set the stage here, and then we'll bring Andy on. Um, her first videos were from February 2011. Um, they were introed with the Astral Society caught up with spiritual catalyst Teal Scott. Apparently her name used to be Teal Scott. For a brief interview in Salt Lake City, Utah. She is from Utah. And if you go through the, clip, uh, the clips from that interview uh, from February 2011, you find out that she doesn't associate with any one religion because she believes in oneness and says that religion divides rather than unites. She says that she was born with extrasensory perceptions fully intact. She says that she perceives everything in motion, that everything looks like a vibration to her, including other people, and that she can interpret that vibration. And she specifically claims that she can see auras, and she can also see inside people and see their bone structure. And she says that war is the equivalent of killing yourself since we're all one. Everyone loses in war. So she's not particularly uh, violent. And she said when asked, what's the meaning of life? Uh, I actually quoted, this is a direct quote from her. She said, life serves the purpose of the universe at large, evolving. We're in the process of consciousness becoming conscious of itself. Does that it does that through our thoughts? So every time a person or non-person, any living thing, comes down and experiences this life, we create the idea of the improved life, and then we become, or successive generations become, then improved. This is the reason for species evolution. I'd say the purpose of life is this evolution towards a oneness, a unified oneness, which is consciousness. Okay, so I. Wrote all that down from what she had said there. And now, as we come forward in time, looking at her from 2011, I, I like to, you know, one of the first things I like to do when I look into this stuff is look at what they were saying on day one when they first came out publicly as a figure and were starting to put themselves out there. And then what are they saying now? How have things changed over this time? And it doesn't look like it's changed a lot. There is now merch and there is now uh, workshops and seminars and things you can attend. Uh, which we will talk about in detail, but apparently this is now developed into uh, sort of bringing in Jungian psychology and New Age ideas, and it sort of revolves around a philosophy that you might have heard of called the secret or the law of attraction. Uh, these type concepts where you manifest your own reality and your life is a reflection of your spiritual condition is kind of the, the, a, a core idea of law of attraction or the secret and this kind of stuff. And she calls herself now a catalyst for personal transformation. And, of course, a catalyst, by definition, in a chemical reaction is the thing you need in order to make the chemical reaction occur. So she's positioning herself as a very necessary component in anyone's life in order for them to 
transform spiritually and you know obviously we assume that that transformation is going to be a good thing and that you're going to be transforming into something awesome and wonderful and wouldn't your life be so much better if you were following Teal Swan's advice. So that all being said as the stage setting here I want to now welcome Andy Fellows. He uh, is a YouTuber and he has been putting out videos about Teal Swan and been uh, talking about her on some different channels and stuff. He's also been getting involved, like I did after Scientology, with finding out about what destructive cults are all about, how they work. Um, and we're going to talk here about whether his involvement with Teal Swan's group was a cultic involvement or what. What was what was that all about? So, Andy, welcome to my show. Thanks for having me. It's a joy. Yeah, to absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. So, yeah. first off. Let's uh, let's set a little stage here about you. Who are you, and why should we listen mm. to you? <laughs> um, wow, big question. Um, now I'm in the hot seat, aren't I? Uh, better have a good answer for that. Um, I'm Andy. Um, I don't I don't necessarily think you should listen to me, but maybe take what I'm saying and then do your own research and see what you think. I think that's probably the best approach with this. Um, I'm going to obviously share my point of view as I do on my channel. Um, I do as much research as is possible with this kind of stuff, in particular with Teal. And as, as you said, I've looked into other cults as well, because cults are fascinating. And especially when you've been in one, you're like, right, how does this work? What's going on here? Uh, and, and why are there so many other things that look so similar? Um, which is always something that baffles me, how cults are very similar to each other, actually. Um, when when you when you start to look into them, so yeah, I don't think you should necessarily listen to me and take my word for things. You should listen to me and then take what I'm saying and look into it. I think. <laughs> well, you have pa- you have passed the cult leader test. So oh, good. Well, well done. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did you? Um, you know, you're you're clearly you know uh, not aged or advanced in years. How how old are you? I'm 26. Thanks okay, I appreciate that. Yeah, no, I and I and I'm it just because we have an audio only audience as well, so they're not going mm, to see okay. you. Okay, okay. And um, I just want to I, I want to point out that um, you know, sometimes like in my case, it takes a lot of time before mm. you start getting it through your thick skull that something might be maybe a little wrong mm. with the situation you find yourself in. Let's go ahead and look at your situation and see mm. how did this whole thing, what, what was your involvement with her? How did it start? Um, you know, this has been called an internet cult, mm. yet there is a mm. real life component to it, which I didn't know about when I first started yeah. looking into all of this. Yeah. So um, what, how, did, how did you first become exposed to her and, and get sucked into it? So it started for me when a close friend of mine died that was when the whole thing kind of began um and as you know with cults typically it's when there's a life change something bad's happened that's when they get you so um a close friend of mine had died and it's the first real death in my life so i didn't really know what to do with it um and so i found myself just watching documentaries on youtube like all day while grieving i didn't really know what to do with my feelings so i just threw myself into some so I was watching history, uh, history documentaries and then History Channel documentaries and then Ancient Alien documentaries. And it all just kind of, you know, one thing led to another. And I think the thing with Ancient Aliens, of conspiracies in general, they provide quite a certain escapism where you can, like, I remember watching a Channel 4 documentary about it where there was a guy that was saying he felt like with, with um conspiracies it gave people something that they could be sure about when reality is so uncertain and scary and confusing sometimes for people that gives you something with, that can explain stuff so that was kind of where I was at that was my frame of mind you know I was looking for something that could explain what had happened and how I was feeling you know all those kinds of things so um when I got a taste for that I went onto my Facebook and I said, has anyone got anything in this kind of vein that they know of that they can put me onto? And I was sent spirit science, which you may be familiar with. Um, I know. Go ahead and elaborate on on what that is. Um, So yeah, spirit science is a, when I found it, it was, um, as far as I'm aware, something that had come off of Newgrounds, or I think that's what it's called, like an animation site. 
I'm not too familiar with that, but um, it's basically cartoons, spiritual cartoons um, intended to teach. And um, that's, that's what you see from the outside. Um, Telltale's done a number of videos looking at, um, at spirit science. Uh, and it's very interesting. Um, so I was watching them and, and, and they, they're, a lot of it's based on Dream Velo Melchizedek's Flower of Life book, which again, big time woo stuff there. Lots of claims, not much evidence. And the evidence, quote unquote evidence that they do provide is kind of, um, they look at actual history and actual archeology span and stuff and then kind of reinterpret it in their own way and knit it together in their own way. Um, in that oh kind my of- goodness, I'm looking at their YouTube channel right now. Yeah. Spirit Science. Spirit Science, 869,000 yeah. subscribers. Spirit mm-hmm. Science 1, Thoughts. Mm-hmm. A vision of the future, chakras, channeling, oh, psychedelics it's versus pharmaceuticals. It's still there. Yeah, you use this meditation. Day with that one, Chris. <laughs> oh my goodness! I'm telling you, wow. Okay, so this is per- this is a channel that that puts stuff out here of a spiritual, new agey kind of religious flavor. Mm-hmm. Minute Faith. They have a series of videos called Minute Faith. Everyday magical things. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So kind of a woo wooey sort of a yeah with thing with cartoons. Yeah. So it appeals to the kids. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, it's it's fascinating. And so okay. so, so somebody so, turned you on to this thing. Yeah. So I watched them, and what you what you find with spirit science is that they will make quite bold claims, and they'll say science has shown us. And, and you're like, si- right, clear up the science bit for me. What science? Who? What studies? You know, all that kind of stuff. But you get that a lot with the, with the new age stuff. Science has shown us this. And then they'll say something that science hasn't shown us. Um, and so that I kind of watched all of that. And this is me as someone who, just a bit, bit background on me. Um, I didn't grow up religious at all. I had religious people around me. I got Jehovah's Witnesses in the family. Um, and my family have always been curious in their own way, but I kind of grew up in on like self helpy stuff on one side of the family and then just nothing religious on the other, because the other side of my family, they'd just been turned off of religion completely because of Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, so I came to this not really having the critical faculties to know what to do with it, Plus, I was I was grieving, so it, I was in a place where I didn't really, you know, I, I should have known better, but I didn't really. Um, so I was taking it all on and, and absorbing it all. Watched everything Spirit Science had up within a matter of weeks. Then started watching the guy, the guy's vlogging channel as he was traveling around because um, he, he put a bunch of videos up as well. I mean, that's a whole other rabbit hole to go down. Um, but he um, did a video with. Teal at the time, Teal Scott. And that is where I found her. So I, I was watching his channel and then ended up going over to her channel from there. I believe, I think that's, that's how it happened, but it was such a long time ago now and so much has happened since then. But that's So she was I collaborating happened. with him, what was yeah. this, back in 2012? 11? 2012, yeah. So 2012 was a really big push in the new age community because they were going towards what they called the the but you know, everyone got a bit hyped up about the Mayan end of the world thing. Yeah, I remember. I'm remembering that now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So obviously, people who weren't really into it was like, "Oh, Mayan says the end of the world," and they just kind of had a laugh about it. Other people were like, "Actually, no, they didn't say it was the end of the world. What they meant was this." And then the spiritual people said, "It's not the end of the world. It's the end of this kind of way of living, and we're going to ascend, and we're going to enter a fourth dimensional reality and blah 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 and there'll be three days of darkness and then we'll be reborn so there was all this kind of stuff that was talked about um around that time and um spirit science was was big on that um because i think that was talked about in dream of lemma kisadex flower of life that a lot of the early spirit science stuff was based on um and so i think teal did some stuff about that as well so there was this whole kind of um building up to something vibe throughout 2012, you know? Um, and 
that was supposed to be 21st of December, I think it was supposed to be, that this was going to happen and everything was going to kick off. Obviously, it didn't. Um, but after the oh, fact... Oh, there, I don't know. I mean, is it is it so obvious? Did it happen? Did that anybody claim that the, that the big day well, came and they're now viewing things through the fourth dimension? Or what, well, that, what happened with that? That's what, uh, they, they, they made all these claims and then obviously as is quite common when they make prophetic claims where there's like a clear point, as you get close to the point and it starts to look like nothing's going to happen, they soften their conviction and then they're like, well, I mean, and then after the fact, it was like, well, something definitely did happen. It just wasn't what we thought happened as is. I mean, you see that all the time, right? Of course. Um, well, this is, it was studying this kind of stuff that they, that they literally discovered or came to realize what cognitive dissonance is. Mm. It was studying yeah. a UFO cult that said mm. the end of the end of the world's coming, and it didn't come. <laughs> and then they went, oh, and then they said, well, it was only because we were praying so hard and we are here and we exist that the end of the world didn't come. Had we yeah. not existed, had we not been here at all to you know propagate and share the faith, then of course mm. the end of the world would have come. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, now the new it's... end of the world is coming twenty one years from now. And yeah, 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 yeah. we'll build exactly. up to that now. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. So this, this like, is here's what a, we thought. Yeah. If we cut this bit off, cut that, off, that bit off, it kind of fits into what we'd like to believe. So let's just go with that. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting to go cognitive dissonance. What was your, I, I'm curious at the time, what was your response when December 21st came and went? Just, I mean, I know this is all pre-teal kind of, but what, what were you, yeah. what was well, your no, cognitive so at dissonance? At that point, I was... At that point, I was, it was very teal for me. I was into teal. Ah. I was, by that time, by the time the December 21st happened, I was fully into teal's videos and I, I just consumed everything. I'm that ah. kind of person. I get into summer and I just, just absorb everything. But what happened on, on December 21st, I remember they were saying these, something like 11, 11 a.m. on the December 21st, you should meditate and then you can like take in all the energies and stuff. Saying it now, I can't, but I can't help but smile because I'm just not that person now at all in any way. Um, but yeah, I think no nothing happened. Like looking back, nothing happened. But at the time I was pretty sure I'd absorbed some kind of energies or something else, you know, something or other. Sure. Um, and well, my cognitive dissonance kicked in and I was sure something happened, you know. Of course, of yeah. course. Well, let me ask you a couple of questions about this period because I'm curious. Mm -hmm. What? So you're all in at this point. So 2012 is a is kind of an important year for you mm -hmm. um, with this. By the way, this is the year that I was leaving the Sea Org. So okay. while you're 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 diving into Teal Swan, I'm leaving the Sea Organization, but I'm still mm -hmm. still in Scientology. Um, mm -hmm. Wow. But I'm curious, what was it about, you know, you see a collaboration with her on on this uh, Spirit Science channel, but then what was it that made you go, oh, wait, what's up with her? I'm, I, I want to follow this. And then, you know, you start binge watching her videos. What was the appeal? What was the thing that, that, that hooked you? I think you would hear this from anybody that you ask that question, who's been a Tila. It's probably two things mainly. Um, she's an attractive woman and she is so confident in what she's saying. She's so sure she's right. And so you look at her and you think, I will, I will listen. I'll keep listening to you. I'll see what you have to say. And you get sucked in. And so that was kind of what happened for me, you know. Yeah. Are the demographics available for her followers? Do we know how many males versus females? No, but I would think that it's probably more females, actually, just because uh, in my in my experience, and I haven't got any, I haven't got any statistics on that, but in my experience and um, in the experience of the people that I've talked to about this, actually, because it is an interesting question, I do see a lot of females. Um, and the kinds of people, they're typically very lovely people um, and typically people who are quite... Um, struggling with mental mental health issues um uh generally speaking because obviously she does offer some ideas on mental health and so on and so forth um so yeah but then you also see and I, this is interesting this is not just isolated to teal's following but in the new age in general you do see a lot of um a strange amount of like misogyny and 
that kind of attitude of like very conservative ideologies, which you wouldn't expect in like the new age of people that are like enlightened and evolved and aware, but you do see that a lot. Um, I've had, I've had a lot of that actually come back at me since I started doing these videos. You see that in the comments, people just being quite unexpectedly quite, um, quite misogynistic and quite um, hateful of, I don't know. I don't know how to put it without upsetting the wrong kind of people. Um, but I'm, you know what I mean? I'm, well, I'm trying to, and I want to make sure that I do understand what you're trying to say here, because I think this is an important point. I'm I'm wondering if misogyny is... I, I mean, it, Teal Swan is a woman. She yeah. very clearly identifies as a woman. She mm. very, very easily... It's It's very easy to see that she makes herself very attractive in her videos. She's uh, the exception, hairs. though. That's the thing. Teal is the exception to every rule. Oh, um, okay. So does she preach a, a misogynistic gospel? No, no. What you what I what I'm kind of getting at in general, and as I say, it's not isolated to Teal in particular, but you do see. I think I think it's something that I do see quite a lot in general, and this is just my opinion, but I see it quite a lot in general with religious, highly religious people who do tend to have quite. Um, conservative values very old timey kind of values in general regarding gender roles regarding sexuality um those kinds of things um and it does it does come out quite interestingly in the new age um it's almost as if you can't um skip over personal growth by doing a bunch of meditation and um you know i i see that quite a lot in in people that you just think you're supposed to be evolved, you're supposed to be enlightened, and yet you're saying things that someone who has thought a little bit about the way that perhaps saying something like that might affect someone or people in general, um, maybe wouldn't say that, you know. Um, but that's an aside, really. That's, but that's quite an interesting um, thing I've noticed with New Age in general. Interesting. I, are you referring then to, I, again, I'm just trying to make sure I understand what you're saying, because mm. I'm not, I don't have experience with this directly. Um, are we talking about pushing traditional gender roles, traditional family structures, traditional hierarchical um, systems, or what, like... So uh, you might be right in saying that misogyny is probably not the right word, but I, yeah, oh, okay. you do see that. But there's there's this thing about masculine and feminine energy and about how... Oh, have, like, oh yeah. energies, and yeah, then you yeah. have people who, who aren't necessarily in New Age cults, but feel that they've, they've kind of kept the thoughts and feelings they had before they became a new age. So you will see men who kind of get into it and they, they, the word I could use to describe it and I describe it and I don't want to be like nasty or anything, but it's a kind of slimy feeling that you get off of some guys in this thing. They're all ultra spiritual and they come in and they just sort of using spirituality to get close to women and it's just another form of, of, of misogyny, the way that that manifests, I think. Okay. Um, so you're talking about guys trying to get laid by getting involved with that's you know, one spirituality. Aspect of it. And... Yeah, yeah. One aspect yeah, yeah. of it, yeah. Okay, I and get it, it. And it comes out in a bunch of other ways as well, like the kind of comments I've had on some of my videos of people just... Because obviously I wear a little bit of nail varnish sometimes and people don't like that. And the fact that I've got long hair, people don't like that. I'm supposed to be something else, apparently, so... It's very interesting. And they'll use that to try and like ad hom, you know, just like, oh, well, don't listen to it. Don't listen to this guy because he's got nail varnish on. He's got long hair. It's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Interesting. Well, let me ask you, just since, since this has come up and it's a yeah. point and it's clearly affected you in through the comments mm. and stuff. Um, what are Teal's views are towards the LGBTQ community? I think she may play like the queen card on this one, like, um, and not the queen card in the LGBT sense, the queen card in the British queen in, se in the sense that if she doesn't have too many opinions about it and she keeps what opinion she does have to herself, she'll upset less people and thus appeal to more people. Um, I think that's kind of what I have heard her mention um, trans issues, I think once in a video, but I can't recall what she said about it, if I'm honest with you. Um, I'd be, I'd be, I don't know if interested is the word, but I would be interested to see what she had to say about that. Um, yeah, but I don't, yeah, when I was involved in it, 
those issues weren't something that was as talked about and I wasn't as aware of myself and I hadn't come to terms with my own sexuality at that point um, as a bisexual person now I'm very much able to talk about those things and connect with that aspect of myself but then I hadn't really come to terms with that so it wasn't something I was thinking about and so I wouldn't really notice if it was mentioned as much you know Got it. Yeah. Okay. Well, getting back to when you were getting in then. Yeah. You had you had you you mentioned that you had noticed she was attractive and she was very mm. certain about what she was mm. talking about. Of course, certainty is itself a trap. I've talked about that myself with Scientology mm. because it positions itself as the science of certainty. <laughs> so, that's one of the Oh, dear. One of, yeah, it was one of the original <laughs> taglines L. Ron Hubbard invented for Scientology was it was the science of certainty. And I know how appealing that can be because when mm. somebody claims they have answers and they are absolutely positive that those answers are real mm. and that they are proven and that they have uh, worked on a number of people and they will work on you too, uh, then that can be very appealing. Is, is that kind of the flavor of what was appealing to you at the time? Yeah, the certainty, her confidence, the fact that everything she said was the truth um it just it's going to have an effect especially when you're someone who's dealing with the uncertainty and and the pain of the issue of of, of death you know that's that's gonna it's gonna get you so that's kind of was my end really was oh because you know, she knows, was right what she's talking about because you got on this whole thing from somebody a friend of yours dying and yeah. she talks about death quite a bit she does yeah more recently or or in the interim period I, when i was getting into it it was very much astral stuff and non-physical and and dimensions and the law of attraction and shadow work and the law of attraction and shadow work are two things which are they, they've stuck through the whole thing until until recently the astral stuff and the non-physical stuff it's there now and like the the alien stuff all of that stuff's there now but it's not as talked about. In fact, I remember when I was um, following her, she was quite reluctant to talk too much about the whole star seed energy thing. Are you familiar with star seed stuff and and all of that kind of stuff? What what that brings to mind for me when you bring it up is the idea that there were aliens inseminating lower life forms back in the day, and there that's why humans exist. Because um, so they well, were like Zechariah Sitchin's twelfth planet kind of. Yeah, like aliens yeah. have sort of like we've been a breeding farm of one kind or another for aliens. We've been a slave society for aliens mm -hmm. in the past. I mean, there's that lots is of different talked about in the New Age stuff, and I think Spirit yeah. Science touched on that briefly because that book influenced uh, Dreamblow Melchizedek's works. Uh, star seeds in the teal context uh, basically have a soul or whatever that has come from another planet or somewhere else in the universe. And that's not unique to Teal. I think that's a new age thing in general that she kind of co-opted and claimed to be an authority on. One of the many things. Um, and so... So so the idea is we're not native spiritually to planet Earth? Not all of us. Some of us are, apparently. Others... Uh, and and this, is, this is an interesting thing, because I've actually... I have talked to, uh, to other people who are critics of Teal, former members and stuff about this. And the kind of consensus is that some are more special alien origins and some are less special alien origins. So if she likes you, then you might be a Lyran. Um, she's an Arcturian and, and th those are the best ones. Um, and, but if she doesn't like you, then you're a gray, you're a gray alien, which is like your ET kind of thing. You know, oh, um, right. That's uh, Whitley Stryber's, uh, you got the greys coming around and, and uh, yeah. kidnapping people and it looks shoving, like she was shoving stuff of... up their butts and stuff. Yeah. It looked like she was thumbing through the prototype art for the extraterrestrial compendium going, that one's right. me. I like that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah. I have to laugh at that stuff. Scientology, <laughs> of course, is like that as well. None of us are, mm. are, are native to Earth. Uh, Earth is just some remote, you know, planet out they on the just, rim of they the pull galaxy. The rug and they pull the rug out from under you as often as possible with what you think you know, right? right. Destabilize right. your worldview and then replace it with something that they think is better right. or whatever yeah well you also had the fun and the excitement of having a still living cult leader who was mm. still coming up with new methods and new theory and new background while you were there going you know mm. i i uh l ron hubbard died when i was 
you know, 15, 16 years old. So mm-hmm. I, um, so there was a point where it was kind of like a done deal and all the answers are there. You just got to go through, you know, 5,000 lectures and 10,000 pages of, of stuff. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, you have Teal. You have the possibility of being able to ask her questions directly, go see her, things like that. Yeah. So, okay, so star the Starseed stuff was sort of there. There were other things that were attracting you to it. I'm just I'm curious because this was all done via YouTube. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is all right. just videos. There's this the, somebody had turned you on to it on social media, and then you just consumed it through YouTube. Mm-hmm. And how many hours do you think of videos you had watched by the time December 21st came around and you were all in? A lot is the most precise measurement, but I, I can expound on that a little bit. Like, so, so as I mentioned to you earlier in um, the Gizmodo podcast that was done about Teal, they interviewed Stephen Hassan and he made mention of the fact that her videos Uh, may have a hypnotic effect on people watching them. Um, The way she talks, the backgrounds that are used. Um, I have noticed that's been less um, frequent. Those two things have been less frequent since that podcast came out. So in her defense, she may be either trying to reduce the way she looks. Well, she's she's trying to reduce looking like a cult, whether or not um, it's still a cult or not is another issue but um, it seems like maybe she's trying to sidestep those accusations by doing that but at the time in 2012 when I was watching these videos it was it was it was um, I mean the early videos early videos and you've seen them they're like square they've got her artwork in the background most of them or just the wall or whatever Um, and um, she's she's speaking in a in a if I remember rightly she's reading off of a script so she's very paced um and then the videos go on from there and and you start to get um her a little bit more her actual confidence personal confidence starts to come through in the videos then as well um and so i wasn't just watching stuff on her channel she was doing interviews with other people all the time so i was i think it's like buddha at the gas pump or something like that um i remember watching one on there all these other people because thing is with Teal is she does have this kind of magnetism. So everyone wants a piece of the pie. Everyone wants to interview Teal, talk to Teal. And they're all, oh, Teal, you're so great. And you're amazing. And tell me about this and tell me about my star seed energy and blah, blah, blah. So she was everywhere at this time. This was when she was really starting to get, um, to, to start, you know, starting to build a viewer base, uh, really. I mean, she was a year into it at that point and it was already starting to take off um, quite a bit. So I was watching, um, yeah, I was just watching as, as much as I could take, like I did with Spirit Science and the Ancient Alien documentaries, you know. I was watching just as much as I could find. Um, so how whatever was on the internet in 2012 is somewhere close to how much I watched, um, right. to be honest. It was a lot. Yeah. Right. And were you working at the time? Uh, no, I wasn't. Well, I was, but I was working less around that time. I was a guitar teacher, so I was self-employed. And it was a uh, family owned business, so I could go in and out at hours that I was convenient with. So, yeah. Okay. I was, it was, yeah, it wasn't full time stuff. So you, so you had time on your hands. Yeah. I had a lot of time. Yeah. And that's, I, I've run into that with people who get into this stuff, the conspiracy guys too. They'll sit there and they'll, I've talked to people who have warehouse jobs or, or, you know, repetitive kind of uh, labor jobs who can just sit there and mm. consume hours and hours of conspiracy theory or flat earth videos this kind of thing mm-hmm. um you know when i was when i was looking into that stuff um and of course we always make the time for what's important what yeah <laughs> was it about her video content i get that sh- i get the mm-hmm. characteristics of her attractiveness mm-hmm. and her certainty but what was it that you felt you were becoming more certain of or learning that she was providing why 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 her you know if somebody had said hey man you know dump this teal chick and let's 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 go look at some other stuff what would your response Mm. have been at the time and why um i'm not sure all i when you the first question i haven't answered the second question i can't imagine how i'd have answered it would have been some word salad probably um and it would have been coherent from my current standpoint which you can see on my channel i actually looked back at an old video and reacted to it and it was it was incoherent um so um i 
before I answer that, actually, I just wanted to say I watched so many videos that I was able to preempt her answers to questions that were being asked. That was how familiar I was with the material at the time. And I got them right most of the time. Um, I know that me saying I got them right, it's not always that you would want someone else to verify that, but you have to, just have to... Oh, no, I'll, I'll take your yes, word for it. Take my word for that. I, but, um, it's, but, yeah. but it's also interesting to note that she was consistent enough and had created yeah. enough of a framework yes. that you could get yeah. the right answers that yeah, she was no, actually she's not, yeah she's not just making all of it up on the spot she she will build on previous things so you end up with like a law and each cult kind of has their own law right um their own map of reality i think hasn called it mm -hmm. um it's that it's that kind of thing so what it was that when i was watching those videos the thing that really got me was that it was a map of reality. It was, as I think the, the intro video on her channel, tutorial for life, right? That's, that's what it really was. It was, it took my worldview and put it to the side and then gave me a new one where everything made sense. Um, and obviously it didn't quite make sense, but I thought it made sense. And um, that was enough. So, so it was the law of attraction really was the, the thing that underpins it all, the secret. Um, it, it essentially just says, this is how reality is. This is how the world works. Um, and you, you try this and you think in this way and you do these things and so on and so forth. And then you'll get everything that you've ever wanted. Doesn't that sound wonderful, right? Um, and so as, as, as someone, a grieving person, or as is the, uh, quite often the case with people that get involved with, with teal stuff, people with mental health issues, that sounds incredible. Just relief from all the stuff that hurts, um, all the difficult things, right? How do we do this? Okay, how do you do this? Shadow work. That's how you get everything that you want. Yeah, let's talk about this now. I, I, mm. We don't have to get into all the minutia of it. I mean, I could mm. spend, you know, five hours explaining how to do an auditing session to somebody. It's not going to not yeah. going to really make their day a whole lot better. No, so so we can uh, we can be, you know, short about this. But uh, let's get enough detail to figure out what what mm. you were doing. What What is shadow work? So it takes some things is, is some things are very similar for uh, to CBT. So there's the downward arrow questioning that you see in that. C CBT meaning cognitive behavioral therapy? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, so the downward arrow questioning, um, what does that mean to you? If that were true, why would that be so bad? Those kinds of questions are used a lot. Um, I think those two questions are the ones that Teal recommended to use. Um, now, some aspects of shadow work, as I say, have come from things that do work and are practiced in, in regular uh, therapy. Um, other aspects of it are very much tealisms. They're very much based on her worldview. And it's an interesting thing with teal is that she has this thing where she thinks if it's true for her, it's true for everyone, right? Um, so there's this strange false consensus thing um, that's happening. And so she has her backstory, which I'm sure we can, we can get into about how she's had, you know, she's been uh, a victim of satanic ritual abuse as a child. Um, and her thing is she's managed to heal from that. So you can too. And here's how I did it. And of course, in order for that to work as well as it has for her, there's kind of the assumption that you've also been abused. You've also been through some kind of abuse and some kind of trauma. Um, I may be oversimplifying that a little bit, but that's effectively the point. Um, and so she operates on the assumption that everyone is traumatized in some way. And she actually says everyone's got PTSD. Um, everyone she says in the world, everyone has PTSD. Everyone in the world. As far as I know, that may have changed since that, since then. Obviously, there is a consistent framework, which everything's based on. But the, there are subtle changes throughout, you know, um, where things do, do change a little bit. But... Um, yeah, everyone, everyone's traumatized, basically. And in order to heal from their trauma, um, they have to do what she says, and she gets it better than anyone else, especially suicidality. She, she understands better than anyone else on the planet, which is a recent claim. I think you might have seen that in the video, her stuff on some suicide video that you watch. Yeah. Yeah, um, she was uh, quite clear about the fact that she is not trained. She's not licensed. She does not have a, a, a whiff of 
mm. professional counseling experience or internship or residency or anything like that. But she is the most qualified person on planet Earth to talk about suicide and deal with suicide uh, ideation or uh, desires to suicide. And mm. uh, and she may, and she's not shy or uh, humble about that. Her, her humility is definitely her best quality. And uh, <laughs> she is uniquely qualified yes. because of her extrasensory perceptions and her own personal experience. Exactly. Which... And when she said extrasensory perception is when I went, mm. really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. I'll, I'll give you some ground on experiential, yeah. you know, history on figuring some things out for yourself, on going through the literature and and seeing how things might work for you and maybe how that might work for some other people too. Mm-hmm. But when you get in front of a camera and say you are the one who knows everything about this more so than anybody else and that your methods are the ones that really work and what those other psychiatry and psychology guys are doing, I mean, this was straight up Hubbard with a, in, a, in a female body. Telling, you know, I was watching this earlier today and I was mm-hmm. just like, wow, this is exactly what i expected to see so i wasn't at all surprised but it really does take some cojones to to get on camera and say that you are the world's past master at something and she definitely made those claims so Mm -hmm. there's a lot of similarities actually between the two yeah yeah Yeah. so uh okay so she but again i'm i'm curious i am still still want to make sure i get what shadow work yeah the shadow Mm. work stuff and how this was hooking you so um, so did you have to buy a book to get to learn how to do this or was this all laid out um, in your videos or no this was pretty much all out in our videos which okay. is its own problem of course because there are some people that are going to take that do it wrong misunderstand it be in a really vulnerable place and 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 end up worse off um of course the, the, what i would say is that basically everyone that does shadow work they're going to end up worse off in some way um if they do it her way um, obviously, there will be some people who do experience benefits from it. Um, but the way that Teal uh, does it is she really drives home the ideas of powerlessness, of abandonment, of victimhood. These are words she uses all the time. And um, she did a video on hierarchy. And there's a bit in there where she's saying, if you've, been, if you've had a bad experience with someone in a position of authority, you are going to feel completely powerless, right? Um, and again, maybe that was the case for her, but it's not going to be the case for everyone. And that, that maybe of, it might have worked for me, but maybe it may work for other people and it may work for other people, but maybe it won't work for everyone. That nuance is really important when we're talking about mental health. Um, so, so yeah, shadow work, let's, let's not go off on too many tangents. Shadow work, um, in, in general, breaking it down is, is that it's downward questioning, downward arrow questioning. Um, towards a core belief Um, and you might be getting at some point here some flags coming up and some similarities Um, going towards a core belief and that core belief you you will have learned before you were about eight in your life Um, and that will have affected a lot of your life and it's probably based on trauma and if it wasn't based on trauma or abuse which is also often the case um, then what will probably happen, because in a strange way, having some kind of trauma, having some kind of emotional pain is, and I don't want to overstate it here, but it's some kind of currency within the Teal Tribe community. Having a pain that you can show everyone, look at me, I've brought this pain up. It's that um, Camus quote, um, it reminds me of about, if I've judged myself, I can now judge everyone else, right? And it makes me feel better to, to have judged you. I'm paraphrasing and I've probably got some of that wrong. But um, yeah, that's, it's that kind of thing. Like, you, you know, um, you, you go in, you get a core belief, and then you go to Teal Tribe and you show everybody um, uh, that you've got this thing. And then they'll come, oh, you're so brave. Well done, I have this too. And love bomb kind of validate, validate. Um, and it goes so on you there. so this is sort of showing your work or something in front of everybody else like going and Kinda, saying well yeah. I here was this core belief I dug up and Kinda. like what would be an example of of how that would work um what of the core belief or of yeah like what would, showing that what would both like what how would that how would that okay. process work you watch your videos um, you go oh okay I'm gonna do this shadow work now and mm, you okay do this so, yeah 
Yeah, so the idea with Teal Sting, and she said this in the Gizmodo podcast as well, if you have, anytime you're triggered, anytime you have a strong emotional reaction to something, again, she's using terminology that's typically applied to PTSD there uh, with the trigger, but um, anytime you have a strong emotion, strong emotional reaction, typically a negative reaction to positive stuff, that's all fine. You don't, don't touch that because if it's good, it's good, right? If it's bad, you need to work that then. That's the perfect time to do a process. So you take your, your negative emotion and you start to ask these downward arrow questions. Um, by being around Teal, by listening to Teal's teachings, there's a heavy focus on abandonment. There's a heavy focus on um, feeling like a victim and so on and so forth. So that stuff's going to play a part in that as well. And quite often, if um, you see Teal directing this in her live workshops and so on, you're going to see um, her used questions like, what if I told you that? And then she'll just drop something that she thinks is the case in there. And that person will then take that on and possibly formulate a false memory around that. And false memory is a whole other thing with Teal. Um, so you take that thing and um, you ask these downward arrow questions and you go from, so I felt, Let's say I, my worry is that I'm angry today. I've got short fuse today. That's something that's happened. So I've been, I was snapped at someone I didn't mean to snap at, right? So you ask the question, uh, what does that mean to you? Whatever. And then you answer that question, like, I'm, I'm rude, right? Um, or whatever. So you then ask another question, and what would it mean if that were true? Or what, what, you know, if that were true, why would that be so bad, right? If you, if, were, if you were rude, for example. If I was rude, yeah. Well, okay. it would be so bad because I people won't like me if I'm rude, okay? If that were true, then why would that be so bad? Well, then I'd be alone, right? You can see how it becomes quite dark quite quickly, especially if you've had some pre, sort of priming on the, the abandonment, the, the um, victimhood, so on and so forth. Um, now, I just want to say here, if you're doing this with a trained, experienced professional that knows how to handle that, that's a different thing. And they will know what to say, what not to say, how to guide you into a direction, in, in a direction that's actually going to help you um, and have a positive outcome. Um, but that's not the case with Teal. It's not the case with shadow work uh, and as the completion process, which is basically the new version of that with, with added stuff, um, with extra steps. Um, and um, yeah, so, so you keep going, you keep going, you keep going with those kind, that kind of question until you reach a core belief. Um, and typically people are going to cry at some point during this process. Um, more or less, if you're not crying, you haven't done it right. You know, if you haven't really got to a real point of pain, you haven't done it right. Um, and, and when you see it in a life situation, um, Ross and Carrie did that, a really good breakdown of this a couple of times live of her workshops um, and um i listened I, my voice went weird there. i listened to all of that um yesterday because you put me onto that and i was like i listened to that and their interview with jennings brown just um as i said i do that um and it was uh it was fascinating to hear the the way that as outsiders they were able to interpret what was going on and um, if, yeah, with, with shadow work and you're doing it on your own, you will end up with a core belief that you or the people helping you do it, typically tealers, if you're, if you're reaching out to people who understand it. Um, do people will... ever work with one another on this stuff mm -hmm. or is it meant, so it's yeah. not just a solo activity? No, it's, I, as far as I'm, if I remember right, it, it was encouraged. Because this is the thing, shadow work is kind of less used now. Completion process has become the main thing now. Shadow work's still there, but it's fallen by the wayside a little bit, I think, in the time since I've left. Completion process was coming out. But I think it came out after I left. Um, it was in the And, and again, what year did you leave? Um, I, I started to come away in late 2014, um, and I was more or less out in 2015, but I was still very much in the new age, and I was listening to other people, and my head was very much in that space. It was like... How I say it is I was as physically out of an online cult as you can be, but I was very much mentally in. I just left Teal behind and a lot of Teal's philosophy behind. But the way I was thinking, my cult identity, as it were, all that stuff was very much present in my life until, I think, late, to, I don't know when it was. I think it was the end of 2015 when I went to visit my family in England and I was around my family for a month and 
all of my, my personality was brought back out again. And I, and I came back from England. So I mentioned to you, I live in Mexico. So I came back to Mexico as my old self from way back before. Um, so I got into it in England. I moved to Mexico as I was kind of leaving it. Um, but I was isolated a little bit more because I was in Mexico. I didn't know very many people, didn't know the language very well. So I ended up more into the new age stuff, but less into the cult. And then I went to England and got myself back in that time, basically. Um, but just so I want to clear up a point on shadow work, if I can on that. Um, if you're in front of Teal at a workshop, it doesn't stop until Teal's satisfied that you've got to a core belief. And chances are she'll decide what the core belief is. Um, and the core belief may be something as simple as um, I'm, un I'm, un I'm unlovable or I'm, I don't, I'm not worthy of love or usually those kinds of things. Um, and at that point, that's so Edgar Schein's three steps of like unfreezing, changing and freezing kind of as far as I could see would apply to this um, because you go and you go through this process where you're brought to an emotional point, which is kind of like the unfreezing. Um, and then there'll be a point there where T will give you homework or you or the people around you will decide what the new way you're going to be is. You set some goals and then you go for that. Uh, but of course the goals will be based on the things that you've learned from Teal and what the best way of living is, you know, tutorial for life and all that. Um, so you self-indoctrinate at this point. You decide your new personality, your new life choices, your new, the things you're going to give energy to or attention to. And, you know, um, and uh, what is it? Uh, energy flows where attention goes is one of these new age little things, right? Um, so it's one of those things, what you focus on grows. Um, all of these little cutesy little phrases that apply to the new age law of attraction thought. Um, so, yeah, so you, you will. So let me, let me catch up with you a second here and just, mm. I, I'm totally just going to interrupt you and, and just cool. want to make sure that I'm, that I'm on the same page as you with what you're explaining here. Um, basically the idea is that you have made decisions in your life in the past, uh, perhaps under traumatic circumstances or, uh, under stressful traumatic episodes and those decisions or ideas or core beliefs as she calls them they become this like thing that you're carrying around with you mm -hmm. and you use this to think with and make decisions and and you reinforce it all the time because you're constantly using it and it's not necessarily something you're conscious of but it's always there is that mm. is that right yes apart from it wasn't a decision you made it was not a Apart decision. That, okay. It, no, it happened, typically happened before you were eight years old. Yeah. So it was programmed into you and it became part of your worldview, part of your personality, everything. And okay. Teal essentially says that person, all your personality is fake. It's a result of, and she said this in her authenticity thing, um, that, and I think it was a video and post she wrote called How to Be Authentic, <laughs> which seems strange to me. Um, and I, I feel like there's there's certain personality disorders which would make a a post like that perhaps a pre uh, like necessary, you know. But for most people, how to be authentic is not a problem, really, is it? I don't know who's asking that question. How do I? <laughs> how how can I be authentic? Um, well, I'm yeah. I, I'm much more concerned about when you just said now that she said that your personality is is yeah. fake that 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 it doesn't mm. it's not real. Uh, th this opens the door to being able to 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 deconstruct and tear people apart very very easily, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and that's that's the place that's a door you'd really rather believe me you would mm. really rather leave that door closed mm -hmm. than give that authority or power to somebody who might not have your best interests at heart but mm. you know perhaps has your wallet at heart, mm. um, or maybe they do have your best interests at heart but they're still going to screw it up. You know, because because yeah. uh, personality is, you know, the consciousness and and these things are, we you know, we're just barely getting a grip on them through the through mm -hmm. the science route, and um and we know enough to know that we don't know a whole lot of anything yet, and so when someone comes along and starts talking very authoritatively about who you as you are at your essence, and starts making value judgments about various aspects of you and your personality and what constructs exist in your brain or spirit or head or mind or 
astral mm-hmm. projection or whatever you know is the order of the day here this this is just this is right out of cult leader playbook 101 you know that's just mm-hmm. that's just what this is all about is yeah. establishing self as authority figure over mm-hmm. others and you have something to offer them that they cannot get anywhere else mm. so of course teal's going to say that she can peer in and see what those core beliefs are and tell it to you interesting because in uh, scientology l ron hubbard had similar power uh, which he would wield when he did auditing, counseling on people. But he made it a, dicta, a, a rule of counseling that you could not evaluate for somebody else or tell them what to think about their, their situation. Mm. But he would do it all the which time, just, see? He would, he'd be, see, he'd yeah, be the one to break his own rule 24-7, right? And of uh, course, and, there, the thing is, you don't need to actively tell them. You, you just need to create an environment that tells them. And then they'll yep. tell themselves, right? Exactly. And, and so that's uh, the interesting thing with the online cults is you don't have a physical environment. What you do is you assault their worldview at a fundamental level and then replace it with your worldview. And then the everything, your, everything, your perception, there's a veneer over it, right? So everything you see, feel, whatever is now altered by that. And that was what happened to me. You know, everything in my, ex- my life experience became TL-esque, basically. Exactly. This is so much like, I, I'm just going to keep making comparisons because it'll help my audience it, yeah. for one. And two, it kind of helps me relate to what you're saying to make sure I'm on the same page. Mm. Um, you know, Hubbard was, was really big on all throughout his policies is read a book, get them to read a book. They have to mm. read a book. Um, you know, my words are what are going to sell Scientology to people, not you. Don't, you know, don't try to sell them Scientology, sell them a book about Scientology and get them to read it. And that's when they will get on board. And I think that's completely analogous to your videos. So, you know, with mm-hmm. Teal, she's got mm-hmm. these videos. You got to watch the videos. Yeah. If you go talk to other Tealers, they'll probably tell you as much. Like, hey, man, I can explain it to you, but really you got to go watch the videos. I mean, I did that. I was, I was, I was one of them. I did that when I was there, you know, trying to, yeah. trying to bring my family in on it, get them to watch stuff with me. And, uh, yeah, and but Teal herself will say, watch the videos. She'll uh, at her workshops. She'll give people homework to go and watch videos. She'll like, right, go and watch this video. And you hear that in uh, Russ and Carrie, I think, um, when they were doing their breakdown of, of the of the workshop, they said the same thing, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's it's very much the same kind of thing. It's just watch the videos because the videos are these like for the most part. Recently, it's been cracking a little bit, but for the most part, those are the ones which are completely controlled every word more or less apart from when she goes off script which is always fun um every part of that is is sort of um honed and crafted to be the message that she wants to give right um and what you can see interestingly is every every video that goes out there's also a a blog post that goes with it um which i what i think happens is they'll put the blog posts out i need to test this i'm not sure but what i think happens is they'll put some blog posts out they'll split test them um and then they'll see which is better and then they'll make a video based on that but if you look at the blog posts you see what was originally intended in the video and then you can watch the video and see what's changed in the video in that moment of what you think is is the right thing to say or what she wants to add in that moment um as anyone who scripts videos will know it will change a little bit um, but then she would just send people to those videos. And I remember she, she um, in, in Ross and Carrie, they were saying that she sent people to watch a very old video. And in that video, she was like, here's step one, step two. And then it skips over to like step six or something like there's all these miss- missing steps in the middle because she'll just talk and just say things. Um, so even the videos aren't great sometimes. Um, but that's very much the same kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So go I watch the videos. Uh, yeah, and I, it would have to be that way because she's laid out the workable pattern of how this introductory line, I, I'm using, again, Scientology organizational terminology here, but like an intro line. It's a, it's, a, it's, mm. a, it's a series of steps you follow that introduce you to the subject in a standard way. So everybody's mm-hmm. going to have the same questions. They're going to mm-hmm. get the same answers. We've worked this over. You know, and this gets added mm. to and modified and changed as, you know, as mm. you get more people and you find out what works better and better. But these intro lines are mm. the most important part of setting up an organization mm. like this and being able to then profit from it. 
in any way. I mean, if you're going to profit from it in any way, whether it's through adulation or power or other things, you know, or or just make money, mm. you, you know, you want these parts to be the parts that are the most working that mm. and that can mostly do the work almost by themselves. You know, if I give somebody, you know, a copy of Dianetics, if I give 20 people a copy of Dianetics, one or two of them are going to come back and say, I want to do this. Mm. That's just how the numbers work on it, you know. Um, and then you get going. Mm. So, you know, Hubbard crafted it. There's other people who read Dianetics and go, this is a piece of shit. I can't believe anybody reads this. This is complete nonsense. Of course that happens. They don't. Some they're not the ones who come back. Their own cult. Yeah. It doesn't have to work yeah. on 18 of the 20 people. It can mm-hmm. work on two of the 20 people and you'll, you're going to be a roaring success, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these videos get crafted and put out there and, and the blog posts get worked over, like you said, and then they figure out what's working about this and and then reinforce mm-hmm. that. And you've seen her bounce around over different things. Mm-hmm. That's her testing stuff. That's throwing stuff against the wall. That's seeing, mm-hmm. what do they think about this today? You know, Hubbard did about 30 yeah, yeah. different things through the 1950s, just like that. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I'm not trying to say i've got it all figured out yet but i'm just basing this off what you what we've yeah, talked course, about yeah. so far mm. you know i find it i find it fascinating yeah. because these things have to exist in a certain way yeah yeah so i just want to add some to what you were saying there because we mentioned yeah. earlier how there's like a consistent framework of of, of um the world view the, the philosophy or whatever um it kind of works like this you need to find your own personal truth you need to find the truth the truth for you subjective truth but did i mention that the absolute truth of the universe is oneness and uh the law of attraction is the primary way that the universe works and i uh, have a direct channel to source which is in teal's terminology is god um and although she doesn't say that as much recently and there's an interesting just an aside on that um her name teal swan came from a husband, which has more or less been scrubbed. You don't see his name very much. Um, it's possibly because he doesn't want it um, out there. So I won't give his full name, but his surname was Swan. And um, he uh, did a series of what was called Tea Time with Teal. Uh, he was British. And they did a... Um, I, th- I can't remember how many episodes, but it was like a, you, you, you sign up to the mailing list and because it's, it's all very, we'll perhaps touch on this, but it's all very much set up like your standard kind of online business, right? So there's a mailing list and you, you opt into the mailing list and you get, you, 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 know, you get your freebies. And one of the freebies was Tea Time with Teal way back when I was, it was the end of 2014, so I was just kind of leaving it. These have since been scrubbed from the internet, apart from one episode, I think, which you can find on one of the other streaming platforms. I can't remember which one now, Vimeo, Daily Motion, something like that. Um, but they've, they've been taken down, possibly because they were very damning um, uh, regarding Teal's attitude, possibly because he didn't want them public because he was a private person. And one of the, you could call it, you could call it an argument. One of the arguments they had live in one of these things and it was live streamed was regarding transparency and being an authentic person and having everything for the world to see and being a private person and teal argued for everyone knowing everything um which is its own issue because i personally think and i feel there's good reason to believe that there are some things she doesn't share with everyone she will be quite selective about she shares um and he was arguing for some degree of privacy, which I think we can all agree, some degree of privacy is definitely good because um, you, you should be in control of what you want to share with the world at large, you know. Um, so there was that kind of dialogue there. And um, in that dialogue, she claimed to be a direct channel to, to, to source. And he was like saying, this is my perspective, this is my point of view. And she was saying, she was thrown her weight around at this point because she was pushed. He pushed her quite a lot. Um, and you don't see that very much with Teal. People tend, tend to be like, oh, yes, Teal, whatever you say, the best. Um, but he pushed her, really pushed her on this. And um, again, you'll have to take my word for this because you're not going to find it on the internet anywhere. But um, maybe someone's got this. And if you're watching this and you've got 
this downloaded, please find a way to share that. I don't know if it's possible that it can be done without breaking copyright rules or whatever, but it's very fascinating. It's fascinating to see. Um, but she, yeah, she was pushed. He was pushing her and she essentially just said, uh, well, my, my, I'm right because I, I have a direct line to source. Basically, my, my perspective is source's perspective or whatever was basically the, the point of what she was saying. Basically, I know what God thinks and I think what God thinks, so I'm right. Um, and that was one of the moments me and I was just like glass shattered you know I was like okay something's going on here that's a bit weird um, and I remember right that, that was the, that point, was the bridge too far for you one of yeah one of yeah that, that's that one was of. one of the things that started cracking yeah. what was up I, I I actually am not trying to come across like I'm teasing I'm I'm just I want to no, know no, no, what the no. what the marks were or why what what were the yeah. the milestones and that was yeah yeah, yeah. that, that was claim one of, of a connection me. was it a connection to divi the divinity no I mean that is kind of taken with with Teal it's like yeah okay I guess that she sees because she sees more than everyone else she has these abilities these superpowers whatever you kind of assume that but when she started trying to say that her point of view in, in quite quite plainly saying her point of view, her opinions were the opinions of God. I was like, right, God is supposed to be all knowing, all powerful, all wise. Why, why is the opinion, first of all, so dogmatic and, and, and inherently dogmatic the way she was handling that. And, and second of all, why is it so, angry i think was one of the things like she was so angry about this it's like right so it would extend to from god's opinion to god's sensibilities to god's attitude to god's everything you know um it, i don't know it was just it was a real moment for me where i was like it, i just don't think that this person is what she says she is and the way that that was handled throwing the weight around in that way just made me go hmm Interesting. So, so it wasn't the connection with divinity, but it was the way she was conducting herself. Yeah, she it wasn't conducting think, herself. Maybe and she's not got that connection. You know, right? Not a very divine attitude. Exactly, yeah, and it, I'm not the only one who felt that way. I've talked to people who also saw that, who were a bit like, "Hang on a minute, someone not right about that." Um, in yeah. that moment, yeah. yeah. No, it's interesting. It's interesting that that was that was a crack in the wall there. She does Had it for their, herself. She's her own yeah, worst enemy. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, okay. So, uh, you were you were talking about the intro line or the videos and stuff. Mm. Yeah. And let's go the, back. <laughs> yeah. Let's go back a bit here because where where we were at was we were breaking down the shadow work business and um and we we're breaking that down just to kind of get a a glimpse into what is it that people find appealing about what she has to say. And what mm. is she offering them? And if this mm. is all something you can do by watching videos on YouTube, then it's pretty open. It's pretty grassroots. Mm. It's pretty available to people. Mm. So I guess my next question is, if that's the case, um, what, what point does she start doing workshops and seminars? And, um, and is there some point where there are things available that are not? available on the internet mm. Mm. so how that, yeah how's this how's this how's this progressing so i remember and it's just fresh in my memory so i'll reference it uh, last night i was listening to the interview with jennings brown who created the gizmo podcast about teal um that ross and carrie did and i think ross asked jennings about what he perceived to be a currency of proximity to teal um within Teal Tribe, which is what, what it is called. And the Facebook group's a whole other thing. But Teal Tribe is what they call themselves, Tealers. I was a Tealer once. Now I'm a hater, apparently, which is uh, the equivalent of suppressive person, right? Um, but yeah. There's always a label. I, um, There's always a label. Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. I mean, how do you do us and them without a them, right? Exactly. Uh, that's, uh, that's why I can <laughs> say that with such authority and certainty. Mm. Is because you can't yeah. do us versus them without labels. It's impossible. Mm. Yeah. And mm. there's always going to be a label for the bad guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, that proximity to Teal is what you can't get over the internet, I think. And it's 
having a moment with Teal. Teal is just so knowledgeable and so aware of everything and so just, you know, the bee's knees that being in the same room, if you're lucky, you'll get in the, on the stage with her. And um, so you get a moment with her. And so many people don't have any real problems or questions that they want to work with. Um, they just want to be in front of her and, and have her tell them what she sees um, with her powers and all the rest of it. Yeah. Because they all buy into this idea that she has ESP and that she can literally see course, through yeah. them. Yeah. And see their vibrations and all that. That's still that because that's that was like day room. one stuff that she was yeah, posting, no, that's and that's still there. That's still yeah. there. The okay. thing is, you can't claim to have extrasensory. Um, but how does she put it? Extrasensory abilities or something like that, and then slowly taper off on that claim. Like you've either got them or you haven't, right? So you kind of have to stick to your guns with that one. Um, otherwise, people more people are going to see through it. Uh, but yeah, she. Um, she can see the energy in the room. She can see the energy in the body. She can. She used to say she was a medical intuitive as well, which is a whole other issue. Um, so, yeah, she she will. And and so when I, because I went to a workshop in 2014 um, in London, and I was in the room with her. I didn't want to put my hand up. I didn't want to go up on stage because I was quite scared of being taken to pieces in front of everybody. Um, I'll be honest with you about that. That was why I didn't want to go up. I didn't want to be laid bare in front of the whole group. I think that's quite a natural feeling. I think a lot of people would feel that way. Others would would want to be exposed. Like now I have a thing like I want a good therapist who can do that to me, who I can trust and just show me everything and fix me. Um, But when you're in a situation like that and when there's so much going on and your problems aren't really being solved by this stuff. You've got a lot going on inside you as well. So I didn't really want to go up on stage. Um, But I was there in the room and I saw other people going up on stage. And yeah, just to get that few seconds with Teal, can't get that over the internet. That's very much something that you get in person. And people do, people, people go there for that. People try to, people go and live with her. They go and move to live with her. Um, And this kind of feeds into um, what I feel is, it's kind of a cult and then a cult within a cult. And I can't verify this. This is really just my own kind of suspicion. But what, what you see with, you know what you see with two people in a toxic relationship, how that can look like a cult sometimes. And one person with a small group of people around them, maybe a family or what maybe a more traditional cult, as it were, a small but growing group of people around them. Imagine that, but you then add the internet into that. And that's then rolled out to thousands across the internet. That becomes the extension of what was already pretty cult-like, right? Um, So that's what I think has happened here. So you've got Teal, you've got Blake, you've got Graciela, and then you've got these other people around them who are- And these people you're naming are her assistants, her helpers, the people who are with her. Yeah, and you Blake. and you mentioned I, I this that surprised me. You mentioned people go to live with her, so this is yeah. a thing that people do. They she lives in yeah. Costa Rica, right? She flits between Costa Rica and Utah. I think, um, as far as I'm aware, there may be an ownership dispute on the um, Costa Rica retreat because I believe when she was in her most recent marriage, it was a co ownership kind of thing so i'm not sure what's happening with that at the moment so i'm, I'm not I, I try not to get too absorbed in all the personal teal stuff because there's it's a it's a drama show really there's so much going on with the personal stuff that's inconsequential overall other than that it's interesting to understand the dynamics but once you get the dynamics down you're really just looking at stuff and going oh yeah no i've seen that before that makes sense because of x y and z you know um, totally no totally makes sense to me i just want to yeah. i just want to get this answer mm. so so people go live with her yeah. and she just lets them she just has an open house policy not or? not everyone it's okay. not uh, like if if you and i became tealers and in a year's time decided we wanted to go and live with her we wouldn't just be able to rock up and and move in um it's very much a system of you get to you get in with the right people and you start to reach out to Teal personally maybe and she might take a shine to you or you start to make friends with people who are higher up in this structure. Um, it's, it is very much 
sort of that that pyramid structure. That you oh, see okay, so it's a caste them. system sort of thing. Yeah, kind of. But it, again, it's it's the thing with this is it's where you look at Scientology or, or the Watchtower. It's very structured. It's very lay. Everything's laid out in set movements, set um, like programs, and and there's a flow of of information and so on and so forth. With this, is a little looser. It's still, I would say it's still controlled, but it's looser. Um, and so you, you rank and file of the tealers on the internet or the completion process practitioners, which I suppose we can get into again at some point. There's so many little asides and, 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 um, and things, but you then work your way up and you might end up in, in like the core members. And these are people who can actually volunteer at the workshops and so on. And you get a little bit more proximity with teal that way. Um, uh, I know someone, someone who volunteered mentioned to me that they got some one-to-one, -one, not one-to-one, -one, but a smaller group of people got some time with Teal because they were volunteering at the workshop. They weren't going to get the workshop experience. So now they got some one-to-one -one time with her in a way where they did their own little sessions with her. And Whoa. again, you know her through that and then you can, Right. The doors are open. The doors but open. that, but that's interesting. So the workshops or the seminars that she goes around doing, she gets she gets her people to put them on for free. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And she gives them some of her time. Yeah. And that's that's the that's the bargain that she yeah. has there. Proximity so, is currency. Yeah, proximity seems. is currency. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. But it makes sense because what we're talking about here is a still, in fact, a, a forming cult situation. Yes, very much so. This That's is a the really first few point, years. Actually. Yeah, yeah. See, this is this is not a well drilled, well established. Mm -hmm. This is very similar, in many ways, to what we would be seeing in Scientology in 1955, mm. right? 1956 time period. Mm. Hubbard going around, giving twice a year, going and giving congresses to raw, you know, new public people who never had anything to do with Scientology. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, giving advanced training seminars to the auditors, the people who were already in the area. He'd go to Phoenix. He'd go to Washington, D.C. He'd go to New York. He'd go to, you know, the U.K. Mm -hmm. And he was personally going around and giving his time. And, and these people would put these seminars or these congresses was what they were called. But it was Hubbard mm -hmm. lecturing for a weekend is what it was and doing some Scientology on each other. You know, and you get access to the old man, right? And there mm. he is in, in flesh and blood with the red hair and everything. And um, and that was a thing. And they sold tickets to that. And that was like he he got flown out there and he was the VIP, man. He was like Hubbard was the bee's knees. And he did that twice a year. Mm. And uh, and that was that for the first 10 years of Scientology, he was doing that twice a year. And then he established his own central headquarters in the united kingdom and i would be quite surprised if that doesn't end up happening mm -hmm. with teal if she can get the ownership up. sorted yeah. out in costa rica I, I could see the same thing happening i mean it's, yeah. so this is a really important point and i'm really glad you brought that up because yeah. it's something that i haven't really talked about too much and i didn't get a chance to talk about before i changed tact on my channel because i used to talk quite openly about teal but i've realized there's a few reasons not to do that um uh, partly because I started to get threats from people, which I just, no, thank you. Um, also, I realized that the better way to reach out to some people who are inside is not by putting their back up and giving them cognitive dissonance, but is actually to talk about other groups and the commonalities and let them realize that, I think Hassan recommends that as well. Just let them realize for themselves that, and they will, as it's plain, you know, it's clear as day. Um, but one of the things that I do want to mention here is that, yeah, we are looking at what could potentially become an incredibly destructive cult situation. At the moment, as far as I'm concerned, it is a cult. It very much ticks the boxes, but it's, it's still in its, in its formation. And there's, there's not, I, I wouldn't surprise me if, if she rolled out at some point a book that is clear rules and clear Everything now that she's been teaching is now solidified. Do these things and you will be X, Y, Z, whatever. Um, and I don't want to like sit here and get on about slippery slopes, but I do think that we are 
looking at the potential for this to get worse if enough people don't become aware of it and the people who are inside aren't helped through gentle non-threatening tactics to be brought away from it so that's why i'm doing what i'm doing really um yeah. Yeah. Well, well done. And thank you for articulating that so well, because this is a, this is a very, very important point. <laughs> mm. um, and and I and I'm very, very glad that you made that, that 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 we're looking at, a, you know, that, yeah, they were looking at this forming cult situation. Mm. And there are predictable milestones that occur. There are predictable patterns of operation that have to go into place in order for it to continue rolling out the way that it is. Mm. For example, there's if there you know she could put out a book like you said or there could be some centralized you know location or university set up or a teaching facility set up where you can come and you get the you get the you know teal minutes currency um you get proximity to her she gets very willing volunteer worker slave situation because people will fall mm. all over themselves to be close to celebrity or authority it's just in our nature to do that we're, we're silly that way but she will then have to say, okay, this way is the way. There is no other way. This is my method, and this is the method that works 100% of the time. Mm. But she will then have to say, and for those detractors out there who say it doesn't work, here's the label, right? And here's how mm. we're going to deal with those people. Because mm. you have to have a mechanism in place, mm. right? So and you that's see where that the shunning, yeah, the yeah, disconnection... Yeah. That that's that this mm. it, it organically becomes that it has to, mm. right? This is what's going to happen if this is left unchecked. If this mm. continues to roll out organically, this will occur. Mm -hmm. And you see it forming now, like right. th th we've already got hater. I mean, that's, that's, right. that's there. You've got the label. You've got the fact that she disparages mental health profession and says that she gets suicidality better than anybody else, and that her method is the method, um, despite having no formal training or education on this. Again, you know, a broken clock's right twice a day, but is that really the way we're gonna do mental health and suicide? I don't think that's a good idea, you know. Um, no, and you'll see, and you'll see in the long run, if you, got, if you had actual census figures of her intake line and how many people, you know, use her system, do it properly according to the instructions, and what re what percentage of people get a result? Mm. There are your case studies because you are only going to get a percentage, and mm. it's probably going to be a fairly low percentage, to be honest. Mm. Kind of like Dianetics, you'll get mm. a percentage. You know, you can do course, regressive yeah. therapy on regression therapy on people. You can throw them back into earlier times and get them to look at things. And I think what this stuff does, what Teal's work is doing is very similar to what Dianetics oh, yeah. is doing mm -hmm. in terms of what is it actually doing. What it's actually doing is it's casting a person's mind back to times of trauma, trauma and stress in the past, and it's helping that person sort out what were the causative elements or agents at that time. Because a lot of trauma and a lot of stress is hung up on, and PTSD is hung up on, misassigning Who's responsible for what, especially in your direction? You know, you're the one mm. who's fully responsible for your victimhood. And you carry this around with you. You know what I mean? Mm. If you can kind of reorient things to who actually did what when, that all by itself. I'm not saying that's the cure. I'm not saying that's that's what works 100% of the time. I'm saying that when that when you do that with some people, you get a, you get a known positive response. And mm. I think that Dianetics accidentally does that it's in no mm. way trying to do what i just described but it does it mm. and i think what she does in pulling up these you mm. know primary goals you know is it's casting a person back to looking at causative elements in their life and that yeah. that can have it may some well be the case yeah rehabilitative effect you know that's that's what makes sense to me from within the psychology that i've read but you know, mm. I throw this out there as as an acknowledged layperson. I'm not in any way, shape, or form. I mean, that's the same people. with me as well. Yeah. And I'm always I, I want to be so clear about that when I talk yeah. about this. Like, I was in it. I've come out of it. I've done some research, uh, and I'm doing my best to lay out where I found that research for people. But look for yourself because it's it's out there, especially with Teal. The, she's been doing this long enough now, even though it is only in the early 
years, as you say, if it does continue. Um, she's been doing it long enough that people have cottoned on to it. And there's entire websites dedicated to talking about things she's done. Um, I've been in contact with one uh, person that runs one of them and I've got some of my stuff listed on there. There's loads of it. Um, it's just out, it is out there. So you just, just look for it and you'll see. But in terms of uh, the completion process, which I think is much closer to what you're talking about there, perhaps shadow work, definitely. But it seems that that's the best parts, best parts have been taken and put into this new process. Um, which is it's it's a little bit um, CBT, it's a little bit in a child work, it's a little bit catharsis, it's a little bit um, regression memory stuff. So so you've got some stuff that works, and then you've got some stuff that isn't used at all because it doesn't work or is very spotty in its success. Um, so it's 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 fascinating, and of course Teal says it's she's the only one doing this, and it's the best thing, and every, she's so much further ahead than everyone else, and all that kind of stuff which is right. um you have to have sacred science mm -hmm. yeah this is her secret sauce man Tick. this is the, this is what <laughs> she's got you know yeah so it has to be the best of mm. all possible sauces that could ever be had anywhere on any yeah. sandwich you know this is the this is the stuff you gotta get you know yeah so um Okay, so so I'm so I kind of get in the path of of how you got involved here, and I just I I wanted to make sure we covered that real real well because I because it's 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 the most commonly asked question, even if it's rhetorically asked. How do people fall for this stuff? How mm. do they? How could they possibly be so stupid? It's so obviously wrong. Mm. Which is why I wanted to really explore that territory well. And I, do you think we've covered everything from your? introduction in yeah, and going perhaps, all in on this thing perhaps there's stuff we've missed but you always miss something don't you uh <laughs> i feel like that's that's generally it. yeah i mean it's you you it, it either agitates a pain that's already there or it creates a pain and um then it offers you an answer stuff i mean it's marketing really isn't it it's just marketing agitate the pain offer the solution and um that's that's what that is uh and how it works uh it just bounds between the law of attraction and, and shadow work or now completion process really it's you know if you if you want to get what you want and you're not getting it then do this but that doesn't work so you'll then get stuck in this cycle of keep continually doing this until you're changed and you're now one of the many tealers you know i'm curious what would you say looking back and I know your beliefs have changed and all that, mm -hmm. so kind of answer however I guess you want. But what would you say was your high point or what was the point where you were getting the most out of it and what did you feel you were getting out of it at that, at that time? It's a really interesting question. But I think you can get so caught up in all the trouble and the negative stuff that it's, it's easy to overlook that. I think that... Probably it was just that feeling that I now understood everything. Everything made sense now. And that certainty enabled me to be more confident, enabled me to kind of go after things and, you know, smile more. As someone who has dealt with mental health issues, smiling every day has not always been that easy. So that kind of did give me that. It didn't last, but it gave me it for a while. Um, and I think... Yeah, I think that for me was the best part of it. Um, didn't last long, as I say, it did deteriorate quite quickly. The more you do shadow work, the more it damages your mental health in the long run because you just end up with all these negative things on the surface. But yeah, there was a there was a moment there where I was, I felt like I had things figured out. Well, you know, not everything figured out. I mean, I didn't have my relationships figured out or anything, but there was one part, part of my life that made sense, which was that now I understand, understood the universe. Um, yeah, now it's the other way around. I don't understand the universe at all. Um, and I'm fine with that, actually. Uh, it's, it's nice not knowing some things. Um, and the other parts of my life make more sense. But I think that was definitely one of the high points for me was just that. Oh, it makes sense. I know. I know now. And um, yeah, obviously looking back on it, it doesn't make much sense at all. It doesn't make any sense, really. And it's not based on anything that's true. 
um, for the most part. But it felt true at the time. Yeah, yeah. Of course it did. I, I mean, literally, I could have, I could have written down my answer to that question, and you just read it. Like it was, <laughs> I mean, it's so perfect yeah. from mm. exactly what I have already said on video in the past mm. about that subject too, about the certainty and the and the feeling that it gives you, and yeah, even the I I I, I think I failed to mention that, you know, it does make you smile more. It makes you feel like you have this inner glow. Mm. This this inner knowledge that makes you special from everybody else, but they can have it too if they just become part yeah. of what we're doing. Yeah, just try it. Read this. Watch Join this video. us. Join yeah. us. Because <laughs> because it's important to note those high points, mm. and the reason why is, of course, because we need to remember, you know, especially as cult survivors, you know, for as long or as short as we were involved, we were there because we thought it worked. Mm. We weren't knowingly being conned mm. we weren't no sitting there the cult, right yeah we weren't nudge nudge wink wink yeah we all know this is just a big show and we're all faking it yeah. that wasn't what we were thinking mm. you know we really thought mm. this was the shit and that we had answers mm -hmm. to questions that nobody else had and those answers mattered and they made our lives better in fact they defined everything about our lives and mm. And that's what it means to go all in on a belief system like that. And it's and it's okay to not do that. I'm not saying you're missing out because you didn't have if you didn't have that or have that experience. But mm. I think most people have had it in one to one level or another. But but going all in on this is kind of its own thing. Dialing it mm. up to eleven, as we as we say. So, mm. um, okay. So I wanted to kind of look at that and just sort of see that point for you because that's what kept you going. But then after that what started chipping away at that or what what mm. happened there you mentioned that too much of that completion therapy can be not a good thing yeah. i'll well, say for me, it was the same thing with dianetics time. that's for sure but oh yeah the shadow work mm. that's right so yeah. so what but what was it with you what happened well so the the, the moment of cer the certainty was pretty much there until it wasn't obviously and, and when that goes the rest of it does too the the mental health thing started to come back it didn't solve any real problems it was like a temporary solution it was like for a moment it seemed to solve the problem what kept me going throughout it really was the promise that i would be able to have what i wanted i'd be able to manifest my desires you know in, in cult bingo and law of attraction the secret speak is manifest your desires and blah 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 so that was what i was going for but what I found was that that and other pieces of advice that Teal gave, one in particular, um, this is an interesting one because, so I was in a, I was in a relationship at the time and um, we, I think it was a kind of relationship where we had both realized it was over, but we hadn't really admitted that to ourselves or each other. And um, we were living together and Teal's advice look at the person you're with and if you can't love them completely everything about them right now then you shouldn't be with them um everything then, about them everything. everything about them basically everything Just love everything as they are <laughs> if you can't love everything as they are in that moment <laughs> then you shouldn't be with them i'm pretty sure that was the advice i maybe i've paraphrased it obviously i think that was the point of it that was the advice i took anyway and obviously uh, it led us to break up. Now I'm not, now I, I hold, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people who's like, I, don't, I wish everyone well, really, as long as they're not hurting anyone else. So I'm not, uh, although we weren't right for each other, I'm, I'm fine that that's over with. I'm married happily now anyway. Um, so that advice, although it wasn't great advice, helped me get into a better place, but it was other bad advice also that I was taking that was having a damaging effect on my life. Um, like, the law of attraction kind of stuff, which led me to do a lot of this shadow work, which led me to quite uh, dark emotional places, left, led me to live with my, and this is a huge thing with Teela's, I see it all the time. Um, I saw it then, I see it now just the same. Shadow work's been replaced by completion, completion process, but it's still the same. You live with your wounds on the surface. This pain that's agitated doesn't get solved really. 
um, you might choose new ways to live. You might choose new ways to be and do things, whatever, but that pain doesn't get solved. So it's on the surface. And that's another form of currency in, in the Teal Tribe. As I mentioned, you, you kind of show that off a little bit. Again, it's not intended that you're showing it off. You're not thinking, I'm going to show this off, but that's kind of what's happening. Um, and that for me, after a while, I started to realize that it's not working. I'm not getting anywhere. I went from living in a flat with a partner and, you know, it wasn't a great relationship in the end, but I ended up moving back in with my mum. She didn't really have the room for me. And I decided I didn't want to be around everyone else because they didn't get it and so on and so forth. So I put myself in her utility room and slept next to the washing machine for a little while. And I'm following this cult ideology of like, like just uh, get yourself in this place, do the shadow work and you'll be able to attract money to your job. So I'm not making any money at this point because it's not working and I'm trying to make money. And the only way I can think to make money is by becoming a life coach, which is a great idea when your life's not sorted. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I also ended up becoming a spiritual teacher as well because I thought I knew shit. Um, I can swear. Can I swear? I suppose we've done suicide. Of course, you can. That. You can definitely um, swear. Yeah, I suppose we do, we, when you get into teal swan stuff, you get demonetized pretty quickly. Um, so much of it, so much of it is is not safe um, for work or children or home or any of that. Um, but yeah, so it's. I started to. My life just got worse. I I have dealt with eczema and asthma in my life that flared up so i'm living in this tiny room no air circulation you know well and it's and i, I want to be really clear i did make those choices but i wasn't myself at the time uh, and i was under the influence of someone who was telling me this is how it's going to be it's going to work fine see look all these people that come to my workshops all these people blah 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 it's like reinforcing constantly um it's going to work and she's so certain so of course i'm following it and my life's getting worse. Things are getting bad for me. Uh, and I'm realizing that something needs to change here because it's not going anywhere. Um, so one of the big things for me that did change was, so I, was, I, I met my, now my wife through the, the cult, um, through a Teal Tribe dating group on Facebook. Um, a Teal Tribe on Facebook was until recently where people congregated. Um, it's not, it is now, but it's not anymore in quite the same way because I mentioned to you recently, it was actually taken down by Facebook. So that was what, 28,000 people, something like that in the Facebook group. Um, and it got zucked, I think probably because they were talking about suicide and that kind of stuff a lot. It's talked about a lot. Um, people just post in there that they're feeling suicidal and all the rest of it. And they get inadequate advice, uh, in my opinion, from people. No very little direction to mental health professionals, suicide hotlines, and so on and so forth. Um, See, that's and... about the size of Scientology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're figuring twenty five to 35,000 public Scientologists, okay. and then about five to 10,000 staff between the C organization and the, and the city and the city level staff. So, so if we're, you know, it's, it's somewhere between 30, 40,000 people total. We're thinking, mm. So we've got 28,000 so, in the old Facebook group. Yeah. I don't think that they've all made it into the new one. And some of them inevitably will have been inactive. People like with any cult, people do what well, I say with any cult. With some cults, people come and go. You get an influx and an outflux. That's um, right. Um, and you're always, you're always going to have that rotating door, yeah, the revolving yeah, yeah. door deal. Mm. So, but then her, her YouTube, last I checked, had something like 600,000. Mm -hmm. uh, subscribers so it's, it's on the internet it's quite big of course not all of those people are going to be tealers um no that in fact most of them aren't yeah probably not you know They're because people, people go to a channel they don't always unsubscribe when they stop mm. watching it mm. you know that's the number of people who have been curious about her over yeah. all these years yeah and did members in the facebook group on the other hand right that's, that's a your thing there's those yeah. are your dedicated people. Those are the guys who are like, yeah. God damn right, I'm a tealer. You know? <laughs> yeah. If it's a cult, I don't mind. It's a great cult. It's the best cult I've ever heard of. You know, that's all that right. kind of stuff. That's right. Yeah. 
Again. Uh, oh, I used to say the exact same crap. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I said that because I wasn't aware of it, and there weren't as many allegations at the time of that. Um, I don't like. I don't know if it's even the word allegation is, is the right word for it. Really, there wasn't as much evidence for that position. Yeah. Sorry. So many tangents. I do. That. Yes. Go and on. and they are wonderful tangents. We are we are finding out. <laughs> All kind, as I knew we would, we are finding out all kinds of little things along the way as they come up, and I think that's mm. the best way to present them rather than trying to, in an interview format, I think that's the best way to let it roll is just organically mm. go from one to the next and stay on a main thread here of your journey. Mm. You well, know. you feel free to redirect me at any point. <laughs> Don't worry, I will. Please continue with your journey. Right. Okay. So where did we get to? I was, yeah, I was starting to get disillusioned, really. I mean, I did go to the workshop. Is that black licorice? Maybe. <laughs> We've talked about this before. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So before I get into like leaving and stuff, maybe it's a good idea to talk a little bit about the workshop. Um, because that was like the peak of my teal involvement, really. Um, and I suppose like with, with a lot of cults, you have people, lovely people, genuinely lovely people that get caught up in this too. And you do meet a lot of really nice people that you meet, really kind people, good hearted people generally. Um, and as is the case with this particular group, which does seem to be uh, something that is a bit different to other, other groups in that in this group you have, people who do tend to have mental health problems or ha who are in a lot of pain um, quite consistently, not just at the point that they were brought into it. Um, whereas obviously Hassan talks about people who are uh, high achievers, people who are, are doing great, the cult doesn't want to burden themselves with, with people who are in uh, difficult situations and difficult mental health positions and so on. In this cult, there are a lot of people who are struggling. But I did she actually she actually markets to people who have hmm. issues or have something going on. I'm glad you like that. like blatantly, openly, directly yeah. Oh, yeah. markets to that mm -hmm. class of people. So it's it's not an, an it's it, it I want to be clear that statistically speaking it makes sense that there are going to be more people with real mental health issues involved mm. in Teal yeah, Swan's yeah. group because she's literally marketing to them mm -hmm. yeah, you know yeah. that's that that's that's a fact mm. so I'm you know it's you not a, it it's not any statement of you know everybody who follows teal swans of you know retard or an idiot or mm. something that's not that's not mm. that's that could easily be misinterpreted as some kind of bullshit like that and that's not what we're saying yeah but no it's not not at yeah. all i mean it's in in the gizmodo podcast she openly said that she uses a the she types in the things that people will search for, or their, her team, I think, type in the things people will search for when they're in their worst state. Um, so they find her videos. And while we're on that, her, re her, her video on what to do if you're suicidal was taken down by YouTube for violating its uh, guidelines, which is actually a really good thing. I'm not big on censorship in general, and I don't think that it's necessarily a good idea that the Teal Tribe group was taken down by Facebook because that may force members underground. And I do have a video I've written, possibly will go out next week, talking about censorship and banning and cults and things like that a little bit. Before this, uh, I was going to say, I don't think it's a bad thing that the video was taken down, though. That's a different issue, I think, because it is openly giving bad advice, I think, generally, to people who will take it in different ways. And some people will take it to, to feel that they're being encouraged to kill themselves. This, I believe, is the video wherein she mentioned that suicide is like a reset button. Her words, I think, not mine. Um, now, that video, what you can actually do on YouTube, you're probably aware of this, is you can go onto a YouTube page and you can pull off the metadata. You can actually look at the keywords that people use to that get a video in front of certain people. So I did that. And I've actually, before it was taken down, I did that. I've got the keywords here of from that video, which I thought was worth sharing so you know the claim that she's targeting these people she made that claim of course let's let's have a little look at what she's doing to target these people with metadata um i've got uh, I'll, I'll just read out the keywords here because there's there's a few some of them are just general you'd expect others are a little bit more troubling so things like 
suicide. Uh, this is a, this, by the way, if this video was going to get monetized at this point, it's now going to be demonetized because we've got a list of suicide related keywords. That I'm just going to read off suicide, suicidal. These are the words Teal Swan and our team have used just to be clear in the metadata of a video, which was entitled, I want to kill myself. What to do if you're suicidal, suicide, suicidal. I want to commit suicide. I want to kill myself. I want to die. What to do if you're suicidal? What to do if you want to kill yourself? Suicidal ideation. Suicidal fantast. I think that's a typo, but I've just copied and pasted it. I think it's supposed to say fantasy, but it says fantast. Um, teal swan. Teal swan and suicide. Help me, I'm suicidal. Help me, I want to kill myself. Depression, hopelessness, despair. Suicide attempts, suicidal thoughts and feelings, suicide prevention, suicide help. Should I kill myself? How to kill yourself? I want to commit suicide. Wow. So those are the, that's, yeah, it's pretty uh, troubling, I think. Yeah. And um, Well, the course, effort's clear. Yeah, it is, yeah. And of course, we need to be clear as well that this is not a mental health professional. This is not someone who's trained or qualified to give advice on these things. Of course, people can have opinions and we will all have opinions and we'll talk. But again, when you say that you are, as she said, that she's a symbolic representation of authority for some people, when, when you claim to understand suicidality better than anybody else, when you claim to have extrasensory perceptions that mean you can see inside a person, right? You start to elevate yourself above someone just saying your opinions. You start to elevate yourself above just the average person who, who's got a theory, right? Um, in a theory, in the colloquial sense, um, I, it's 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 troubling for me, and and I'm not. This isn't really a call out as much as it is just evidence. There you go. If you think that's troubling, as I would I would think it is, then that should be a red flag, really. But um, yeah, I haven't I haven't shared that. I thought this would be the right place to share that because it's uh, it's definitely applicable to this issue. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So just wanted to make you know, since we opened that bottle, I just wanted to. Mm pour it all the way out and show everybody like this is what's going on but this is mm. not us you know deriding anybody or calling anybody mm. names or in any way you know commenting on the uh, uh, making a value judgment about people with mental illness that's not mm. what any of this is about it's simply a statistical fact that that's what's going on mm -hmm. over there and that's the world she wants to be living in mm -hmm. yeah we, nobody nobody forced her to put all those keywords and phrases into her videos. She did mm. that. Mm. So that's what's going on over there. So mm. anyway, that's just a provable fact. Yeah. Uh, not an and opinion. Yeah, yeah. And and um, you can, you can if, if anyone has, still has the link, I've got the link here to that actual uh, video. You can follow the link and you'll see it's been taken down for violating YouTube's community guidelines. Um, so YouTube had a, had a problem with it. <laughs> definitely um not that not that that's a really good benchmark <laughs> no I, I'm, I'm not gonna particularly agree with you on that one but um, yeah we can we can yeah. at least say that 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 shows something that there may be something questionable in it now it does not mean that there is something questionable in it we can judge that for ourselves but um yeah i i think just to go back then to talking about the workshop and the people and stuff you know some of the people i, I met in there are lovely some of the people have also left um, a lot of people I knew at the time have actually also left and I've been in touch with them since. Um, and so I went to the workshop. I didn't really have the money to get in. I'd spent all the money I'd saved to get to London. And I was like, I'll just hang around. I'll see some people. And then a bunch of people said, no, we'll pay for you. We'll give you the money so that you can get in, um, which is quite a lovely thing to do, you know, aside from it being here, let me pay for your indoctrination, you know, but it's quite a lovely thing for anyone to do at any point. And say let's pull together and give you the money and you can get in if you're not able to do that um so uh they did i got in went to this workshop and the, if you want to get an insight into what this is like i listened to um as i mentioned before ross and carrie they went to one and they sat there and talked through the whole thing that's probably as close as you could get in my opinion at this point that i've been i've heard at least the closest thing to actually being at one without being at one because they did a really good job of showing you what it's like and the kinds of people that are there and the kinds of experience you'll have and really setting the scene so that's quite fascinating to listen to um but so i i went along to one of those how much was it for you to attend i can't remember now 
I don't think it was that expensive uh, to get into the workshop. It's quite cheap. The workshop, the, the like expensive twenty bucks, stuff, or I think it was closer to. I honestly don't know, but I think it was closer to fifty pounds because it was it was okay about yeah, fifty pounds. All right, like that, yeah. So it's not and... extortionate for a workshop. In fact, you might expect more for some workshops. Um, of course, workshops are people that have qualifications and that can actually offer something you would expect to pay money for. Um, uh, and I, it was said to me when I contacted Blake after the fact about not being able to, uh, may, potentially not being able to attend because I didn't have the money, he did to me, well, just let me know in future if you want to come, but you haven't got the money, I'll, I'll let you in. Um, which was, again, it's like th th money clearly at that point doesn't seem to be their interest. Things may have changed since I've left and there was a lot less merchandise available when I was there, I think, than, than a few years later. Um, but again, that's not the big earner. That's that's like the again we're talking about the uh, the business model. You get in, you get the freebie, then you get the small investments. The small investments like a book, a little bit bigger, maybe come to a workshop, and then you get into things like completion process training, the curveball retreats, uh, the singles retreats that she's done in the past. Those are the those are the big earners for her. Those are the the places that you really invest the money. Um, but again, it's not quite the money grab that like Scientology is, for example. It's it's a different kind of thing. For Tio, it seems to be, look at me, I'm wonderful. That's what she gets out of it, you know, the the pedestal that she's obsessed with <laughs> talking about. Well, no, exactly. Pedestal. And there's and there's money, and then there is more money, and then there's mm. other ways of making lots of money. I mean, there mm. are all kinds of levels that this oh, can we'll work add up, at. Yeah. You know, um, and I don't even mean in any untoward way. I just mean different levels of counseling mm. she can provide, different levels of mm. access she can provide. Oh, now there's you know. a premium service as well. I mean, yeah. this is the thing. It looks like a business. And if you don't know what you're looking for when you're talking about cult, you say, oh, it's just business. It's your, your average kind of like self-help guru kind of thing. But when you, you look under the bonnet, you look under the hood, you start to see... That there's a few things going on there that aren't so good and then you look a bit further and you do your research on cults and you go okay right mm -hmm. i see what's going on here so yeah right okay so uh so you got to that workshop mm. didn't get access to her directly or what no so the, the only access i got directly was I was in the room, she came up on stage, she asked everyone how they were, there was a mumble and I, I shouted out, and how are you? And she went, I'm fine. And uh, that was that, she seemed a bit uncomfortable. People don't shout out very often, I don't think. Um, and it's possible, so this, this feeds in, and I don't, this, so at this point, I'm gonna talk personal experience completely, because this was a personal experience I had. And, um, I don't know how much of this is me just trying to make sense of things or whether it's because this is the thing with cults, especially when we're looking at a cult like this, that there's not that many former members talking about. Um, a lot of it is, is this just, am I just seeing this or is, did this actually happen? So I shouted out at that point. I may have singled myself out there as someone who wasn't just going to fall in line and, oh, T was amazing, blah, blah, blah. Right. Um, I, I had a habit in college of being the kid that shouted out um, and wound the teachers up. And I think that carried on and bled through a little bit there. So I did that. Um, that workshop there, I didn't go up. I, the, I was with some people. One of them went up. Um, and uh, while I was in London, I was staying with other, other tealers as well. I wasn't, I was there for a few days and I'm, I wasn't like, hotel in or anything because I say the money situation wasn't great and I was so I was staying with people of the tealers um and the workshop I met a lot of people who I'd known from teal tribe there so as you were saying the real world component comes into play there you meet online you talk to all these people you build these connections so in the in the workshop and stuff what happened was I met Blake now if you know about teal and stuff you've heard of Blake Blake Dyer who is one of so the way I see it is the power structures. You've got Teal at the top, and then you've got Blake and Graciela, who are like the inner circle. Those are the ones that they don't change. They've been there, as far as I'm aware, since day dot. I think Graciela was someone that Teal helped. That's the story that I've heard. She was one of the first, in the first waves of people that came to Teal. And they kind of, Teal kind of just took a, took a shine to her. Um, so Graciela's like Teal's bestie. 
and she's there. She kind of plays mum sometimes. I met her and Blake. Graciela is his is her kind of bestie. She's the left hand whatever. And then Blake is the right hand guy, right? So Blake does all of the online stuff, I believe. Um, I think uh, you can see where Blake's been typing things on the internet because there's always a few little typos um, that are left behind. So I can use, so I feel like he's done that metadata because of that typo in there. It's just conjecture. Um, but I met Blake at the workshop and we took some pictures together. Um, I've got, I've still got all the pictures and everything from this workshop if you want to see them at some point. I got talking to Blake a little bit. I think we exchanged phone numbers at that point. And I invited him to come and hang out with me in, in Camden uh, the following day, or the, the day after that. Cause we, me and a bunch of other tealers went to like Glastonbury and Stonehenge the next day in a little road trip. And then we came back to London. And cause England's very small, you can do that. Um, and then we went to, um, we went into Camden in London, which is sort of, there's this big market there. Anyone's not familiar with that, it's a big market. Lots of kind of hippie, kind of new agey things you can look at and, and that kind of stuff. So we went there. And I uh, spent the afternoon, me and a few other people spent the afternoon with Blake and Graciela. Um, and it was interesting. It was very interesting experience. The lights again. It was a very interesting experience. Um, and I don't, I still don't really know what to make of it, if I'm honest with you, because it was, it, there was some strange little things that happened, but on the face of it, it could well have been quite a friendly encounter. But when you see, when you consider that I may have singled myself out and needed to be checked on and perhaps as a potential to be brought in further, perhaps as a potential to see whether or not I was going to cause trouble um, and, and was maybe there to cause mischief. It, we've seen more recently um, people go into Teal's workshops and potentially deliberately you know, be in there to cause trouble. Um, and she will say that they're cult indoctrinated and that they've been, they've been put there to take her down or that they're uh, haters and blah, 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 you know. Um, so, yeah. Shall I tell the story of my afternoon with Blake and Graciela? Do you want me to go into that a little bit? or? Yes, please. Yeah. I'm I'm I am interested in uh the fact that they took a day to spend with you guys. It wasn't just you, yeah. it was you and other me and a few other people, yeah. Two four four other people, Teelers, yeah. Um about four of you, huh? Four others. So it's about five of us overall, plus Blake and Graciela. Now for them, coming over to the UK was a special trip. I believe so. I mean they, they do like travel they around. There. No, but they travel around for, for seminars all the time, for workshops all the time, especially now. It was a little less frequent then, but they do travel around a lot. Um, so it was, it, yeah, it was a special trip. It was, it was a business trip, though. So it wasn't, yeah. So if, they had, uh, if, so if they had allocated a day to spend as a tourist day, this would have been that day anyway. They, they, Presumably, uh, yeah. Okay, and so they decided to spend it with you guys. Yeah. How, so how did how did it go talking come, to the two teal, people closest to teal ever in the whole world? Yeah, well, it was uh, it was interesting, and I think about it every now and then through like doing the videos and stuff that I do. I do think about it every now and then, and just like wonder if that was what that cult does, or you know those kinds of things. So um, there were some interesting things. Teal didn't come, although obviously I was like bring teal, but no, she didn't come. Um, uh, but I believe she was on the phone to Blake at one point throughout the time that we were there um, and possibly text message contact. So what happened was we'd organized, we were going to meet up in like this kind of African themed bar kind of thing. It was underground. Someone I was with had suggested the place. It wasn't organized, but um, well, it wasn't organized by Blake and, and Graciela or anyone. Um, but it was a kind of weird place. It was like underground. All the, it was beautiful, but strange. The walls were like wooden carvings and it was very dark and the lights were kind of um, weird, kind of bright, sort of neon-y, but it was very hazy, the environment in there. So it wasn't bright lights. So it was a strange kind of place to be anyway, right? Um, and so we're sitting down at this like huge wooden table. And like I say wooden, I mean like rustic wood, like not like it's supposed to look like sort of rough. So we're sitting around this table and uh, it's me and these four other people. And, and I think 
Blake was sitting down next to me. Graciela was opposite me. And it sort of came up that Graciela has this one trick, right? She has this one trick that she does. And what she does is she stares into your eyes for a couple of minutes and don't blink. And then she'll be able to raise your vibration by doing that. Um, raise your vibration. Okay. So raise your vibration <laughs> in this context is like, so your vibrational energy is, is kind of high vibration is good, but low vibration is bad, basically. Low vibration is negative stuff. If you're in a low vibration, you're in a low emotional space, you're going to attract low vibrational experiences, you're going to manifest low vibrational experiences. Is that, is that too much lingo to make sense? Or does that, that, is, it, that is L. Ron Hubbard's tone scale described a different way. Yeah. It gets there's so many similarities. Like I've done yeah. some research with Scientology, but talking to you about it and seeing you call those similarities out is very interesting. Yeah. Um hundred so, percent. Yeah. Yeah. So, Even the positive and the negative things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's you so want high, high, high vibration is high yeah. vibration. So she's gonna make you happier Basically, by staring yeah. into your eyes. Mm, yeah. Okay. So, so, we, so we, I would I would want her to raise my vibration. Yeah. Okay. So I was I was there with all these people and I was like because I'm this kind of person I don't want to be like singled out in a group necessarily which is an odd thing to do to be, to become a YouTuber if that's the kind of person you are but well plus the guy who's always yelling out <laughs> yeah yeah but I mean if you're in a group like that and you're there's just like five or six of you and someone's everyone's going to look at you and it's a small I suppose it's it's a smaller group you're put on the spot more like at school when I was younger, I would never put my hand up in class. I would, I would go bright red if they called me out. Um, but then as I got older at college, I got as teenage, you know, risk taking behavior kicks in. You start to think, you know, I'm, I'm going to call out. I'm going to be the cool guy. Uh, and you end up being a dickhead. Uh, but so that was kind of, I suppose it's, I, <laughs> I think that. Yeah. I don't know two, anything about any of that. Never, never did any of that when I was in school no. or, or afterwards. Never. No. Yeah. No, never. No, never everybody, seen. everybody I know from then and now will swear I was, I never did anything like that. Absolutely. So I was, um, I think it's, it's probably, you know, divorced family in that you're kind of two people depending on where you are with mom, you're like this with dad, you're like that. And I suppose that comes into this a little bit, the accommodation of different environments. But so I was there and I was like, well, I don't want, I, I don't want to do this really, but I kind of want to do this. Like part of me was saying, this is weird. This is uncomfortable to stare into someone's eyes. And part of me was saying, yeah, okay, I'm getting this. Let's see what happens. I mean, with, I'm with Blake and Graciela. What could go wrong? Right. Um, so she's going around and she, she does this eye gazing thing on a number of people. Eye gazing is quite, it's a thing. you'll hear it in new age as well. They do that quite a bit. Um, and they were doing it with each other. Uh, Graciela was doing it with each person and I was last on the list. And what I found as she went round was that, Certain people responded more positively to it. There was more of a reaction. One of the people I was with, um, lovely person, had quite a strong reaction to it. Got kind of giddy. It was almost like she'd had a bit, a bit to drink by the time it was done. Very, oh, very happy and very like lot giggles and all that kind of stuff. Some of the people, to lesser or greater extent, were affected. One person didn't get anything from it at all. Um, it happened with me, and. I don't, I don't really know that I got anything from it, if I'm honest, looking back. Uh, but after it happened, Graciela stood up and went off to the bathroom pretty quickly. Like it was at the end of it, it was up and off pretty quickly. And then Blake followed her. And um, they were gone for a, a few minutes. Um, and then Graciela came back and Blake was off on the phone then. He was talking. I could see him. He was over the other side of the room, but he was walking around on the phone. It was very like look like this is is this objectively strange? Do you think this is strange? Like listening to this, because I always I I, I make... think that it I think it's very very easy to make it strange. Yeah, but no, in and but of no. itself, their actions it's not are not that strange. Okay, good. No, because because like, I'm I'm this it's hard to know what to make of that. Yeah, it could um, it could definitely fall for everybody who's freaking out right now and rushing to type a comment about how wrong yeah. I am. Look, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm not saying no, that it wasn't. I'm not saying. I'm not saying that the circumstances that occurred in reality 
were not strange. I'm saying that they mm. didn't have to be strange and all of those mm. st- same physical actions could have still occurred because he was watching yeah. this from a distance. You don't know what was being said to no. who or what. So the phone thing is, yeah. now, I'm kind of like, it's, it's equally possible that he literally just got a phone call. Someone was going on in the hotel and Teal wanted to talk to him because he's like, you know, they're, they're like that. So... Right. But my, my main thing is, like, it was a bit weird. The, the eye-gazing thing was a strange thing to have happen. That was clearly there was an intention to get us into a certain state. Something was was being intended there. And then the, they just sort of disappeared. And when she came back, she said to me... I, I, sh- I should clarify the eye-gazing part. That That is strange. Yeah. Okay. Good. I'm so, glad we're yeah, on the so same we're, page about that. Yeah, yeah. I was talking about their behavior after she got up. Yeah. So yeah, the that, whole eye gazing thing is weird as hell, and and wait yeah. until I tell you about TRs in Scientology. Okay, so yeah, yeah. You, hang you, fire you, on that. Let me yeah. let me just say the end of this little story, and then we'll go for that because I'm fascinated. Um, so I'm sitting there talking to so so this whole thing. Gracie goes off. Uh, Blake's around. Um, that I never knew what to make of. I was like, is that weird? Isn't that weird? It could be X. It could be Y. Whatever. Uh, Gracie came back. And said something like her hair puffed up in the bathroom. She looked at herself in the mirror and her hair was like all big and stuff. And, I was like, and then she came back and told me, call back to a starseed energy moment, that I have Lyran energy, she said, I think was what she said to me. Um, which is actually in terms of the scale of what's good in starseed energies. And I know there's, if there's Teela's watching this, if there's new ages, oh, it's not like that. It doesn't work like that. You're wrong. Honestly, this is the impression I got. I'm only speaking from my experience on this, but Lyran is up there in terms of the kinds of whether you're good or bad. You won't be Arcturian. Teal's Arcturian. It's very rare that someone else will be that good, but you might be Lyran if you're lucky, right? Pleiadian's also pretty good. Um, so Lyran what's, like, what's Graciela? Oh, I can't remember. I think she might be Lyran or Pleiadian, one of the two. Okay. Um, but, but she but, can't be Arcturian. Of course not. No. no. No, because no. she she's too close above. to the throne. She can't. She yeah, can't, no, yeah. exactly. You don't want to get, don't want to be getting ideas, do we? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, <laughs> but so, so it's interesting with Graciela. She seems to be honestly a very sweet, very gentle, very kind person. Very, the exact kind of person. And again, not making claims, but it does seem to me that we're talking about someone not professional. But it does seem that we're talking about someone with Teal who does perhaps have uh, narcissistic personality disorder, as is quite common with cult leaders. Um, and around people with narcissistic personality disorder, you tend to find people who are being, are a supply for those people, right? They surround themselves with people that are a supply. Now you could say this whole cult is a supply. Um, and as we've talked about with the adoration and all that kind of stuff, definitely. But obviously she's going to want to keep certain people close who are ideal supply, ideal playing into this so that's not a slight against Graciela at all you know actually I met her and she did seem quite lovely and Blake more or less the same but I do feel like when you're in this to the extent that they are and there's things that have happened over the years with this you're kind of complicit at this point you kind of you kind of yeah <laughs> yeah so um there's there's yeah there's the two sides I mean yeah there's a lot to be said about mindset though as well mm. you know so it, it mm. complicity comes with understanding you're doing wrong mm. if you don't know you're doing wrong then you know how could you be complicit yeah, in something it, you're you can be complicit then, in something influence. good Undue well, influence as well. Undue influence is a is a big factor there uh when somebody holds a position of authority over another they can make them do all sorts of funny things. Mm. We all know. Mm. But I want to I want to stress that um, it's easy to armchair quarterback responsibility. Of course. Uh, you know, it is difficult in the moment. It is difficult at the time that things are happening to be able to know all the intended and unintended consequences. Mm. And I don't say this to excuse criminality or, you know, gross, you know, civil unrest or anything like that. I'm just trying to make a point that... Mm. You know, we need to maintain a little bit of distance on that sort of thing because we're not in other people's heads. And, and if they were to come out at some point and speak to their experiences, we could then to have a real conversation about that with them. Mm-hmm. I honestly hope that that, that does happen. I, I know that it's yeah. kind of a, a, it's <laughs> maybe a bit naive to expect that it would, but I would hope that it does at some point. That like, because if if someone that high up in a, in a group like this and specifically this group was to speak out 
it would it would really change things and it would make it a lot harder for it to continue and the people that are being taken advantage of in this situation people that are as, as some people have killed themselves following her advice um I, as far as i'm aware four at this point have done have done that uh, which is four too many um and and i feel like and when you and when you say following her advice i just want to i would i want to what is that what does that mean um, so the, the, the teachings that she teaches about how suicide's a reset button. Um, and that video that got taken down. Yeah. And, and other things there was, there's again, it, it, the Gizmodo podcast does a really good job of, of honing in on the suicide aspect of, of homing in on the suicide aspect of this. I've not done the research that Jennings Brown's done. I've only heard that and done my own research on top of that. So I would recommend that for anyone who's interested in that aspect. But there, there was one, um, there was one woman who was actually, one of Teal's personal clients, if you like, before she became the, what she is now, who was following her um, advice, who did kill herself. Um, and, and Teal had told her, commit to life or commit to death, I believe, is what she said. Um, which okay. uh, Jennings talks about in, in the podcast and says, it's really not that cut and dry. It's not that black and white. And so many people, especially people with mental health issues, are never fully committed to life, but they're not fully committed to death either. And and they people live their whole lives not fully committed to life, and do fine. Generally speaking, they're able to have moments of happiness. They're able to feel fulfilled, and so on and so forth. So it's really not that simple. Um, and but so that's what I mean when I say her advice. I'm talking about her teachings. I don't always frame it as teachings because I feel like that gives a little bit too much to whether it's you know valid or whatever. So sometimes I'll say advice. Sometimes I'll say opinion personal opinion versus official teaching although the line is somewhat blurred when we're talking about this kind of a person you know of course i totally get that yeah. the thing the thing that needs to be noted about this is it is a very nuanced very difficult topic suicide mm. and advice regarding is also very 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 context specific you go taking you know you could take any 911 call you could take any suicide hotline call mm -hmm. and select out one or two lines and make the operator look like a, a you know a, a, an evil troll but within the context of the larger conversation what they're saying mm -hmm. is you know perhaps exactly precisely what needed to be said at that mm -hmm. moment so um i don't know that there is an unusually statistically large number of suicides coming out of her group that a claim could be no. made that no. there's some you know problem there with that but i know that this is a topic of discussion i just wanted to yeah 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 frame that properly because um statistics are what are important when you're talking course, about a topic yeah. like this i suppose i suppose from my point of view the concern is that that number will grow and that we are to, as i say we are talking about someone you're talking say context is important and saying the right thing at the right time when you're helping someone is important two two points here is that if you're not trained, then you can't know whether you're saying the wrong thing. And also, um, if you're targeting people who are struggling with mental health issues, who are actively searching, I want to kill myself on YouTube, and you're not trained, then you're, whether we're looking at actual suicides or not, whether we're looking at whether or not she can help these people, and as you say, maybe some people will be helped. It's an immensely irresponsible thing from my point of view that you would put yourself in a position where with no training, with no knowledge, with no education, other than your own personal experience and your superpowers, that you would, that you, would um, you know, attempt to help people. It's noble to try and help people, of course, but I think it's irresponsible. And I think that her confidence is is really a shortcoming in that instance because it's doing damage i think and whether people are killing themselves or not i can speak personally and i can speak having spoken to other people who have been in the group during my time in the group and for others this has been the case too your mental health doesn't improve actually it doesn't get better you don't feel better you, your problems aren't solved and typically when you leave your mental health actually gets better and you feel better and I spoke to um, Yana on my channel. I interviewed her. Uh, she was a former admin of the Teal Tribe Facebook group. She said to me, I asked her, did your mental health improve when you left? I think I, I, think I said something like that. And she was like, yeah, it did improve. I, I felt so much better when I left. Um, 
And so, I mean, that's, that says something. If we're talking about someone who understands this stuff better than anyone else, you wouldn't expect your mental health to improve when you stop following that advice. Um, but yeah, this is all, obviously suicide, as you say, it's such a complex thing and maybe, she, maybe she is helping some people, but it's, well, there's, you there are you certainly, know. you know, exactly. There are certain, I, I'm going to be the last person to say that she hasn't helped anybody. There are, mm. uh, uh, you know, in the video she posted mm. about suicide that is still up. She, there are, the, the, there are many comments from people saying that she mm. helped them. Of course. So mm. fair enough, right? I, mm. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to put this out there as like, okay, we get it. You know, there's no statistical mm. case to be made there. I'm not trying to make a claim here that she's causing, you know, an undue number of them. But at the same time, I agree with literally every word you just said. Mm. The, the lack of training and then the level of certainty she is displaying and the, the, the fact that she outright says, I am the authority on this. I'm the one who knows what I'm talking about. They don't. The, the mental health, so-called mental health professionals don't know what they're talking about. They're giving bad advice. They need, you know, they're flocking to my workshops to find out what I'm doing because what I'm doing is working. These are the things that she was saying. Mm. She is in no position to be saying these things. She has no statistical data I've seen or could find. Um, Now, I could do a more exhaustive look, but I didn't see any claims. And it would certainly seem to me that if she had a statistically large or significant percentage of people that she was assisting who were were in a suicidal frame of mind and now they're not because of techniques she used and applied, I would like to see some case studies. I would like to see some Mm. peer review. I would like to see some Mm. actual work done on this because if it's true that she's got a system that works, great. Let's get Mm. it studied. Let's get it put through the process. You know, you don't just get to stand on a video on YouTube and say, I'm the authority. Yeah, that's that's not how this works. You know, so so. so what's interesting about that is that I if you look on, I think, the completion process site and you look at the small print at the bottom of the page, it says and it is a small print. It's very small print. um, It it says font size two, literally. Um, And and so and this was when I looked at it. It may have changed since then. But they say. We're, while we are in the process of going through clinical trials, and you can make that claim and that not be true, I have no reason to believe anything that comes from them, but it's possible that that's true. Um, that, they, that they're apparently going through clinical trials, but they haven't proven anything yet. And so this should not be taken as a replacement for therapy, for counseling, and so on. So that's it's an interesting, important point to be said. Of course, yes, definitely don't take it as a replacement. And that, I think that same thing was said in her suicide uh, video, the first one that was taken down as well. But the issue is congruency here, right? If you're gonna if you're gonna say that you are the answer, and then you're gonna say, please go to an actual therapist. Although we're not, although I am also gonna disparage therapists, you start to get a really confusing issue there. That you would be, I think, Teela's would be forgiven for thinking that maybe the right thing to do is listen to Teela and not go to a mental health professional because the messages they're getting are are, are very confusing there. So. Yeah, it's, it, it strikes me as troubling, that particular aspect of this. And, and as I say, and as you, you said here as well, we are looking at the formation of something that could become much more destructive than it is right now. And I think, so I think if they do go through uh, clinical trials and they are able to prove that this is effective, then that's a good thing. That doesn't mean Teal should be practicing it because she's still not licensed, right? Um, and it should be practiced by life. She has no business making mm. any medical claims of any kind. Yeah. She's not Oops. licensed to do so. She's acknowledged that she's not licensed to do so. Mm. Yeah. Listening to her about medical claims or medicine is on you. Mm. You know, because mm. <laughs> you should Quite know better. You know. Um, I also, I also yeah. want to bring up, I believe that she was... Um, issued with a cease and desist order for practicing therapy without a license by the state of Utah for a video on the completion process that she she was doing that. So what that that explains the paranoia 
about how laws are being passed that you can't practice yeah. if you're not licensed, if you're not a trained professional. Yeah. And she's she like, says, can't just, talk about oh, this. Can't talk is, about it. Right. That's yeah, right. Which is a different, that's like that whole like rage of like, can't say anything anymore. Right. It's like, well, if you're being a dickhead, no. I mean, I mean, yeah, but there's going to be consequences. Right. Like just think it through. Um, but I think that, with, with this thing, with um, the cease and desist order in particular, what it does is it does lend some validation to her claims that it is therapy, which is an interesting question to ask there. And of course, then it's persecution complex and it's all these things that, that feed into that. Um, but of course, a practice or a process or whatever can include elements of therapy without being therapy itself. Um, as this includes uh, inner child work, CBT, uh, other things that used to be uh, used like catharsis, which has kind of gone out of vogue now and, and so on and so forth. So you do see um, some elements of, of, of therapy there, but yeah, it's, it's still not. Well, still if she's making great. therapeutic claims, yeah. then that's the context. And there yeah. you go, right? If it's yeah. if if there are no claims being made, if there's no promises, in other words, mm. right? If they're not saying it's going to cure you of something, mm. um, then it's no harm, no foul, because then it's like there's no medical claims here, so you're not yeah. practicing medicine. You know, mm. there is PR value in the martyrdom of being, you know, chased around by the law, but in the case of this particular thing, practicing medicine without a license or therapy without a license, this is going to get you actually in a lot of trouble. This is mm. trouble you don't want. This, mm. is this is the kind of trouble Hubbard ran away from. They were making all mm. kinds of claims in the early days about curing eyesight, leukemia, oh. cancer, you know, uh, bone marrow problems, et cetera, et cetera. Anything you had, it was going to be psychosomatic in nature. And so it was going to respond to Dianetics therapy. I've and they actually. Speculation that yeah. the reason they set up the Costa Rica thing or part of that was it's different laws, it's a different country. And it. it I, I don't you know that there's a causation. I don't know that there's a causation, but there's correlation there. There's, exactly. That it certainly is a it's moved. a feature, not a bug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, setting up in another country. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. why Hubbard moved to the UK for uh, into the sixties because mm -hmm. he was getting chased out of the United States because he kept, you know, welcome uh, wearing out the welcome mat because they were they'd he'd come into town and and you know work his magic and then until he wasn't so magical and the police were after him for one thing or another and off to the next place he went mm. so now getting back to the thread of your story here mm. after that workshop and after that weird day whether it was weird or not you perceived it was weird yeah it was it was at the time i was i i didn't know any better but looking back on it there's a few things that are odd it was revealed that blake and i have the same birthday for instance and that's important when you're a new ager um because it means things so yeah it's now looking back it's a bit strange um and I, I i have no reason to believe we don't have the same birthday um but it's possible that that was researched before we met up and that it was then brought up in conversation um i can't really remember too much of how many it went how much uh how what sort of advantage would went. that what what sort of advantage would that give him if we would you have both... a connection personally then. And, and like what kind of connection like your brother's in the last lifetime or something or i think he's your father a, or like, what, how there do... was a kind of because it was it was 10 years apart as well we're exactly 10 years apart i believe um share the same birthday and in in the new age circle that means that you're similar kind of people because you're both cancers and you're both this and that and you know so there's that kind of stuff that's relevant but also there was there's that thing of there's a connection between us we have a bond we that we are similar in some way and, and all that kind of thing which is again that connection is important because it means that we're not just meeting for the first time there's something else here that that means that you know there's a connection here no, fair um, enough i get i get the idea and was there anything else he did that day or later? Were you ever connected with him where that that um, came up or that that it, that slight advantage made a difference in some fashion to your relationship? Um, no, and and the reason being is we didn't have that many uh, that much contact after that day. Actually, we connected okay. a few times. Um, I I just remember because like, it was an interesting um 
thing when we first exchanged phone numbers he the first text he sent me was andy you are stella i actually went onto my, my old phone and pulled those messages off the other day so i've got print screens of those um now as record but he andy you're stella which is a little bit love bomby which is a bit of an interesting thing to just come out of nowhere and say to someone um and then um after that day i messaged him again afterwards because it uh because there was a video that went out on teal's channel that he was on and i wanted to like hey i like to saw you in the video you know just kind of continuing on with the friendship but i got no reply um and then i think maybe a year on after maybe less than a year on after i'd pulled away a little bit and was starting to kind of contradict some of teal's teachings with my own teachings because i felt em empowered to name myself a spiritual teacher at that point whole other whole other can of worms that one um but it was basically out of me feeling like teal was wrong and that i knew what was right so now i needed to do this thing but i was still very much imbued with that sense of i understand how the universe works from the teal thing so i started to try and it didn't go anywhere um thankfully i'm glad it didn't now um but i was starting to put things out which directly contradicted what teal was saying um like after i saw the tea time with teal where she was claiming to know what god thinks i put a little quote out that said like if someone tells you what god thinks then they're either they're, they're, something like they're either if they tell you what they they tell you they know what god thinks then they're either wrong mistaken or trying to get something from you or trying to sell you something was effectively what i said and it was around that time i got more contact from blake and he was just kind of just like oh hey how's it going how are you doing just kind of i suppose re-establishing that we have a connection and maybe i won't want to say anything that might go against teal if we've got a friendship that i might ruin and but we didn't really have a friendship um, I think we connected on one of our well, our birthday at some point and kind of said a happy birthday as well but that was it really um, so it didn't really go anywhere I think it, it was just at that point to establish who I was and what I was like and I, either whether I was going to be trouble or whether I was going to be brought in further I don't know it's, it could go either way it could just be tourist day this guy's invited us so let's give him the benefit of the doubt and just assume that that was what the case was you know well, there are, could be any number of explanations there for sure. I'm curious, at this point or later after you left, did you learn um, whether there is any kind of internet monitoring activity within this click or group? You said that he was the main, Blake was the main internet guy. Is he the mm -hmm. only internet guy? Does he have people under him who who work on um, this stuff are there tealers named to monitor the 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 internet in some fashion because um, it's a big so, job and requires many hands you know yeah so there's there's she's got a tech guy i believe that does some of the internet stuff um who she's called a super hacker um which was like a concerning for me when i got the threat that i got um but so so that's there and that's it. She referred to him as a super hacker in the Gizmodo podcast, I believe. Um, I could be misremembering that, but I think that's what happened. Um, and then there's, so the Facebook group is their main online presence. And that has admins who are not Inner Circle members, who are there to keep the rules and so on and so forth. And people would report to them if they had problems with other people in the group and so on and so forth. It wasn't encouraged. But as you could imagine, in any kind of non-destructive cult group, that kind of thing might actually happen. If there's an admin in the group and there's some people have a falling out, they might go to the to, to maybe more in a classroom at a school than a group on Facebook. But it might happen. I feel like it's that kind of telling on them uh, situation. Um, so that did kind of happen in terms of internet monitoring. Uh, if you're referring to like other members within the online setting, then I suppose the closest thing would be the Teal Tribe admin situation. And the admins, actually, Yana that I spoke to didn't really have a direct line to Blake or Teal either. She spoke to Blake probably about as many times as I did, maybe less actually. Um, but she spoke to another admin who it was it was perceived though was never explicitly asked had a line direct line to Blake and to 
the inner circle. So it's interesting, actually, what you see is that her influence is primarily wherever she is, and it seems to come out then through the people that she influences closer to her. But her presence is videos, workshops, and retreats, and so on and so forth, books, whatever. In the group, she's not as present now as she used to be. Um, and obviously the group's changed recently, so I'm speaking there of the old group, the new group. It's, it remains to be seen what will happen there. And um, I can't really say too much about that now. I've seen that it's growing, but that's it. The rules may be different. In the old group, it was discouraged that people criticized Teal in the group. Um, and those, those would be deleted, actually. It was at one point the admins were, I think Joanna said in the interview, to delete those posts we don't need them um and yet in a healthy group you would hope that there would be some line for criticism and for people to you know have some talks about checks and balances you would hope that there would be uh maybe a complaint form on the website maybe some feedback opportunities um i don't know if there's feedback opportunities at a workshop maybe there's little slips you could put into a box or something maybe just an idea just throwing it out there i don't know if that's the case but you would hope that in a situation like this, that would be the case. Obviously, with Teal, we're talking about someone who does not ever make a mistake and never says anything wrong. Um, although she will say she makes mistakes and she will say she has problems and pains and so on and so forth. And she very much frames them in her own way and so on. But yeah. Right. Well, yeah. the idea so, that, I mean, it's obvious from the response videos that she's made recently that they are watching what's being said about her on the internet. Yeah. You know, and, mm. um, you know, I'll, I might even watch this podcast. So mm. they might take your suggestion box oh, seriously, you know. Do you know what? That would be good if they did something with it. Honestly, I'm all for that, you know. Like, this thing, if she stopped acting like a cult leader, in my opinion, that's what's happening. And that's a dog in the background. I apologize for that. If she stopped acting in the way that she's acting and, and fit, fit, you know, ticking the boxes of a cult leader and turned this in a different direction and she was just another Deepak Chopra. It's not great, but fine. You know, I guess I, I may, there may be things I don't know about Deepak Chopra or Chopra or whatever. But, um, you know, if she's just sitting there saying woo things and trying to help people in her own woo way and doesn't overstep the mark with psychology or therapy or whatever, fine, go for it. And it's a little less culty, fine, but yeah, the, at this point, it's worrying, and that there aren't, that there isn't an open channel of, of complaints and feedback and things being done with the complaints that are coming, you know, rather than just batting them back and trying to discredit the people that are saying the things, you know. Um, well, exactly. And when you have anybody who is a critic being called a hater, mm -hmm. ah, I'll tell haters, you don't have to listen to them, mm -hmm. the whole us versus them thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've been asked, you know, what would I want to see? Do I want to destroy Scientology? Is that my goal? Mm. You know, and I've made it very clear it's not. I want the yeah. abuses to stop. I want, you know, yeah, exactly. And, and, and exactly as you just mentioned, you know, if mm. you had a clear cut list of things that was like, look, this is what we want to see. It's not like we want Teal to stop being a public figure or mm. we want Teal to go underground or to mm. stop making videos. Yeah. It's just, just, look, these are the problematic areas. These are the, these yeah. are the problem parts. Exactly, you know? yeah. So there's a video she did, which is um, response to the allegations, uh, which you may have seen. Very long. Um, I didn't get through it. But I've spoken to people who were around at the time that she made that. I wasn't active at that time with, with this whole thing because I was still sorting my stuff out and getting back to myself, you know. Um, but as far as I'm aware, what actually happened at that point was someone that had been sent by her joined a Facebook group, which is, you know, not anti-teal people, but they're people who aren't following teal anymore that used to, and people that see that it's troublesome and so on. They congregate in a separate group on Facebook. And um, I was in that group at a time I left because of just there's some drama and some hassle that I couldn't be bothered with. And uh, some interesting points raised, important points raised, which I've taken on just in case anyone there's watching this now. I've taken those points on and I've considered some things that were raised, but that group in particular, um, someone was sent there to ask for what the problems people have with Teal are. And then she was going to make this video. Apparently, she didn't really address any of the points that were raised, though. She just addressed her own points. 
Um, so yeah, that's that's what that is, I guess. I suppose they looked at the points and they went, well, I think this means that, so I'm going to answer this question instead. Um, that's what my uh, expectation is on that. But yeah, um, so that's an interesting an interesting uh, point with this is that yeah, there doesn't th there seems to be an attempt to not look like a cult. There seems to be an attempt, as there would be, there's an attempt to not appear that way, to not fulfill the criteria. And yet the criteria is being fulfilled in, in a lot of cases, uh, if not all cases, depending on which of the of the models we're using to determine whether it's a cult or not. Um, well, and we I, can... I mean, just because she ticks off boxes and says these aren't true doesn't mean they're not true. Of course, yeah. I mean, she made a video where she literally goes down the, the checklist that Jan Jelalic and, and Michael Angioni put together, which mm -hmm. I have posted on my website and which I have used and discussed at length in hundreds of videos on my channel. And it's a perfectly good model to use. There are many models to use. At the end of the day, it really comes down to an abusive relationship. But mm -hmm. you can you can look at and model model the behavior and the, and the circumstances of this in, in different ways. And, and at the end of the day... You know, is this group constructive or destructive to, you mm -hmm. know, a person's uh, sanity, health, well, you know, future, etc. Mm. And and that's the and that's what you're looking at it against. Mm. You know, so it's yeah. so I just wanted to be clear that it's not really a contest of the models. It's no, of course, it's, yeah. it's looking at behavior, mm. and it's framing it in you know in contexts that are true. You, you want con true contextualization mm. of what's going on. And yeah. looking at that in a broad sense and going, is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? You know, mm. and and on our scales of, of good and bad here, we see mm. that there is, or, or maybe good and bad, maybe troublesome or troubling behavior, yeah. you know, that, that could develop into something worse. We see indicators of that here, mm. and there's, there's no doubt about it. Yeah, and I suppose um, when I was saying uh, whether it fits certain points or not, I, I was kind of alluding to with the bite model, how it, you don't necessarily have to tick every box it's just the more you tick, the more troubling the thing is, right? Um, so, and so when I've done the biomodel analysis, which um, I can send you a link to, maybe you could include it in the description um, up on a site that I've done, which it just covers what I feel are, yeah, the boxes being ticked and I've included citations to as many of those as I can. Some of them are from me and people who were in there who had that experience, but I can't necessarily citate that. So I've included citation needed in, in, in brackets there so people can see that. Take that with a pinch of salt or leave that one there and just look at the cited ones if that's what's important to you. Um, and they link back to Teal's own sources in many cases, things she's actually said, things she's actually done. Um, but again, there are some points on there she doesn't fulfill. And actually, it's a good thing that that's the case, right? Um, but some of them she very much does. So a lot of them she very much does, um, as far as I'm concerned, at least. Yeah, cool. That's kind of what I was alluding to there. Yeah, absolutely, and um, and fair enough. I have been fascinated by all of this. This has been a very, very interesting story here. We are going to move to wrapping up because we have gone for a long yeah. time, and we've covered a lot of territory here. Very should happy I, that we have finished my story at some point, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's exactly what I wanted to get to. Is okay. I wanted to move to the wrap up now yeah, yeah, yeah. of getting back to your main thread here. Yeah, so for me, it kind of, it started to unravel as I started to realize it wasn't working. This law of attraction shadow work, one to the next to the next wasn't working, uh, or one to the other to the other. This oscillation wasn't working out for me, and it was actually doing damage to my life, to my, my situation. And, and I, I started to get quite desperate for it to work. Um, I met my now wife through this and was talking to her over Skype every day and um, for quite a long time uh, each day. Obviously, with time zones, it meant that we're talking her evening, but it was it was um, actually it was throughout the night for me. I think it was her lunchtime. Actually, it was me throughout the night. Um, so I, my whole sleeping pattern got changed around it, and my whole life it started to become focused more on like. This the spiritual thing, but I started to come away from that because I found someone that I wanted to talk to and I could connect with that wasn't fully cult related or wasn't my family who didn't get it and didn't understand, you know. Um, and as and and so uh 
I was talking to my wife, our wife. Um, I'm not going to name her and stuff. I have named her before, but I like to minimize that. Um, if you, yeah, people know, people know, and they don't if they don't. But um, we were talking. She wasn't quite as uh, quite as deep in it as I was. She was in it. She was following it, and she was into it. But she wasn't as far in as I was. So when we were talking about it, things would come up, and I would have to explain what I meant. And as I explained it, I kind of was like, okay, this maybe this isn't as sensible as I thought it was. And then she would ask questions, and I would realize that those were really good intelligent questions that I couldn't answer with the philosophy I'd been given. And so it all started to fall to pieces a little bit. And then I realized that my emotional health wasn't great through talking to her. It became clear that I wasn't doing that well. Um, so I said, you know what, I'm going to stop doing shadow work for two weeks and see how I feel. And what do you know, actually felt a lot better. Um, started to to get to enjoy myself more um, and was able to connect with, and I think maybe it's, I just want to be clear here while we're talking about this, because I've mentioned this before and I don't want people who are tealers to think, oh, you didn't mention this. Uh, so as someone who struggled with addiction in their life, I used to smoke a lot of weed. I don't anymore, I haven't for years. I used to at this time, before getting into the group, during my time in the group, though I fought with it during because I felt like it wasn't good. It was a crutch to my spiritual growth and all the rest of it. Um, so I um, came to a point in the end of that. Now, some people can smoke weed, no problem. Fine, recreational, fine in their lives. I'm not that kind of person. As I mentioned, I'm kind of all or nothing, right? So I just smoked too much and it became kind of bad as well. And that got worse and worse as my mental health deteriorated and following Teal's advice, teachings, whatever. Um, it was actually through talking to my partner at the time, now wife, uh, I was able to stop smoking as well. She showed me the acceptance that a person going through that needs to be loved, whether they do it or not. And that was what really made a difference for me. She was like, whether you choose this or not, then I, I, I'm going to support you. I'm, I'm going to love you and so on. And I was able to stop. Um, and so I should say she was here in Mexico. I was in England and we were talking for, we talked for about 10 months before I came here to meet her. Um, but in that time, we talked about the cult stuff and the new age stuff and all the rest of it and just started to pick it to pieces, having more critical discussions. And um, I started to realize, okay, as I mentioned, shadow work's not doing great. I've been not doing well with that, so I'll stop that. Law of attraction, maybe that's not so good either. And I started to kind of pick that to pieces and test that a little bit more in terms of, has this worked for me up until this point? Actually, no. Um, so again, I, I thought, right, as a test, we'll drop that and we'll just see what happens there. Things didn't change all that much initially. And then I started to think differently and that's when things started to change. I started to go with the flow a little bit more rather than, than that, which it was a step up. It may not be the best way, ultimately. Um, maybe a part of that in moderation can help. But um, it was a step up from trying to control my thoughts, which is such a big thing with the law of attraction. Like your thoughts create your reality is one of Teal's things, right? I can't believe we've got this late into the conversation. I'm just saying that now. But thought creates reality is a big thing that she says. So you become quite neurotic, focusing on your thoughts and your emotions and trying to like make yourself like better in some way. I'm sorry about the background noise. Mexico gets noisy at this time of day. Um, yeah, there's like, you start to get um, quite neurotic, quite obsessed with thinking in a certain way, feeling a certain way, acting a certain way, doing things a certain way. You become very particular, very um, peculiar to the outside, perhaps. And you do see that, again, Ross and Carrie's uh, thing with the workshop, you see that a little bit there as well. People who are very, very particular less accommodating with the world and more I need things to be a certain way um, and that's how I became so anyway yeah th I started to realize it wasn't working started to test whether I'd be better without it and realized actually I was and it was around that time that I heard Teal saying things like yeah like I know source perspective source perspective come through comes through my perspective all that kind of stuff um, and then my now wife was like yeah, that doesn't sound great to me. And that was what 
shattered her. She, she said to me a few times since then, like, you know, for me, that was the thing that, that got me was like, that she claimed that she was literally God's perspective and that she knew and what, so what she thought was the way was like, to be so cut and dry about it was what got her. And then I, that for me was one of the things, as I said, and testing things out a little bit, cause I was way, I was well into it in the way that she wasn't. I was like constantly living this thing. Um, so that was when it started to change and I started to adore Teal a little bit less, you know, and that was a gradual process of coming away. And I didn't leave spirituality there. It went on for a few years and I started to listen to Eckhart Tolle, to Muji, to Ram Das or Ram Das, which sounds a little bit like Ram Das, which is never my intention. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it's just my accent that makes it sound like that. <laughs> but um, I, I think, I think we were, I, I think the audience was not going to be going there, but, but now was, they have. So what's funny with this stuff though, is that when you're in an ultra spiritual place, you don't notice those kinds of things. So you say stuff like that and there's people who aren't quite there and they're, they're like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> right, right. Um, but yeah, so, so yeah, that, um, that it kind of, I tapered off really at that point and started to disconnect from it. I didn't leave the Facebook group for a little while. Um, actually my wife didn't leave until this year. She just went inactive and didn't realize she just wasn't there. Um, and turned off notifications and was like, Oh, I'm actually still in this group. Um, so she trawled through it a little bit and looked at a few things that were interesting, screenshotted a few things for her own personal reference and then, uh, and then left. But yeah, so it kind of, it was a slow and gradual process as I think it is for a lot of people. It, it, some people it's obviously quite sudden, but it's more like a few things that build up to a sudden point where you're like, right now, this is the end for me. Um, and yeah, so that was kind of it. And it did take me a long time to sort my head out and to get to a place where obviously now as an agnostic atheist, I'm someone who's much more critical of my own thoughts, critical of my own beliefs and ideas. And those of others so i um i was unpacking a lot of that for quite a while and the whole descartes apples thing i mentioned that on my channel i just sort of took all my beliefs out inspected them one by one and decided what i was going to put back and at the end i had like a pile of moldy apples that just weren't going back in the basket um really uh in the end of it so yeah that's kind of was was it for me and then i dis disconnected from the group a little bit and I found that the people that I was connecting with didn't really make much of an effort to talk to me so that it was not a formal shunning but there was definitely a disconnection between the people and so on and so forth and then now I've started to, to speak about it publicly a little bit obviously there's been some backlash from people that don't like the fact that I'm doing that and so there's definitely some consequences for uh, for speaking out but um, yeah is there anything that you wanted to know about that that, that part in particular leave like leaving anything else I didn't cover no no that was uh that was actually fine because my my audience is well informed mm. about what happens when you leave a cult <laughs> mm. and yeah. all the shit that goes on and all the craziness and all that and we've spent a yeah, lot yeah. of time talking about all the mechanisms of what goes on in this group and the mm. therapy and what the claims that she's made and the suicide stuff and I, th I think they get the picture mm. yeah you know so I think so one extra point I just wanted to add was that so many people that I see that are coming out of this and I'm in contact with quite a few people that are coming out or have come out relatively recently or whatever um it does leave a mark on you in terms of your mental health as any cult would but in particular with this issue and others like it because it 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 is cowboys in your head dealing with your subconscious dealing with your your uh, life lessons your personality it does leave a mark on you. And so like, it, it's been quite a lot for me to untangle in my, in my head. And I, I see myself now like looking at therapy, which is really important to me to get into therapy. And I haven't yet, but I'm, I'm looking at different kinds of therapy and learning about CBT, right? And I'm panicked. I'm sitting there learning about CBT and I'm like, oh shit, oh shit. I just, I'm, and I'm terrified of being taken back to that mental place. So it does have a damaging effect actually on, at least on me, and I've seen it in other people as well, having left something like that, which does purport to be the answer on, on mental health issues, it does, it does put you at a disadvantage, actually, I think, when you're coming out of it, unless you can overcome that. 
um, for getting the help you need. So I would just encourage anyone to please do that. Just make sure they're licensed. Just make sure that when you ask them what their experience and their license is, they don't tell you about their life story and their magic powers, but they actually show you some certifications. Maybe they've got them framed on a wall, you know, those kinds of things that you can verify, that you can double check that they are telling the truth. And, and just so we're clear, everybody, the reason why those <laughs> frame certificates and licensing boards and all of this stuff is in codes of conduct and, and you know, ethical codes of conduct for, for professions. The reason these things are important is because they're the things that regulate behavior so that therapists themselves don't act like little cult leaders. Like, why do you think that is that we don't talk about psychiatric cults or psychological cults? It's because it doesn't happen that often. In it fact, does, I, but it's I, rare. It, it's very, rare. very rare. And the reason mm -hmm. that it's so rare is because these people are held to a code of conduct and to standards of behavior and therapy that they have to adhere to or they will lose mm -hmm. their licensing, they will lose mm -hmm. their certification in their profession. Mm -hmm. And one of the things... I'm just going to point out as far as like, you know, a big difference between what a therapist or a psychologist is going to tell you and what a cult leader is going to tell you is, is, the, is how far they dial it up. You know, the, the, the psychologists, the licensed professionals are going to keep it at a moderate level. They're going to keep it at a five because that's your average. That's your realistic baseline to start with. And you move it up and down from there depending on who you're dealing with. You go over to the cult leader's office, it's at 11 all the time. We're the best. We're the greatest. We have the only thing that will ever work for you. It will work for everybody every time. Blah, 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 blah. That dialing it up to 11 is what happens when you're not regulated. <laughs> you know, when you, when you, you can get yeah. away with that because there's no consequence to it. But the consequence mm -hmm. is in the real world with the people who buy into and follow that. And then have to deal with exactly what you were just describing, Andy, which mm. is having to sort yourself out afterwards because you just got th put through a, a mental cheese grater, you know. And that's yeah. that's what that's why this business that we've been talking about through this whole episode about you know digging in and finding you know primal beliefs and 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 root causes and I know all about your personality and I can tell you all about it and take it apart right in front of you. This is not healthy stuff to be doing. <laughs> this is yeah. this is very unhealthy practices, you know. Mm. And this is why you don't see psychologists and psychiatrists doing it. Yeah. You know, so you might not get stuff that's going to work 100% of the time on the on the psychology side or on the psychiatry side. This is a given. We understand this. Mm. But at least you're not going to get people dialing it up to 11 in desperation for your money. Mm. And I you suppose know? as well, so just to jump in, I think yeah. as well with with the uh, traditional avenues of help, let's say, you know, the trained, educated professionals, they have a shared body of knowledge which has been tested as well and tested and tested and tested. Now, that's not to say that it's going to work for you every time, like you say, and it's not to say that every single therapist is going to be the right one for you. And, okay, there may be bad therapists out there, but that doesn't mean all therapy is bad. It doesn't mean that all of the mental health everything is is going to be terrible it just means you need to find the right therapist for you and that you need to be aware of the signs of a bad therapist actually and what what's good therapy what does that look like look into that do that research um no the red i've actually done podcasts on exactly that Fantastic. with rachel bernstein who is a licensed Fantastic. therapist so you can find that right here on my channel oh folks. Cheeky little soft sell, nice one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you brought it up. I had to plug it, you know. <laughs> Stick a little card at the top. Yeah, Classic. well, do your research right here on my channel. <laughs> Classic. But exactly. Verify, double check, make sure that you can trust the people you're listening to, people. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this is, uh, yeah, this is kind of gone. We, we have checked a lot of boxes here, you know, yeah. and, uh, and we have looked at a lot of stuff and and we are going to move toward wrapping this up now. So yeah. I want to first off, I want to thank you for taking the time and and, uh, you know, describing me. this in such detail. Thank you for having me. It's I, I've wanted to sit and do this really for a little while, uh, just to sort of hash it out. And so I'm really grateful for the opportunity to do that. And it's, it's 
great to talk to someone like you as well who has some more experience with this some more knowledge with this you've been doing this longer so it's just great to be able to do that so thanks for having me really appreciate that awesome man well i'm sure this won't be the uh this is our first um, i won't be our well it's not even our first anyway it won't be our last collaboration yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no definitely you have to come right. on the channel at some point yeah exactly yeah. all right folks any questions comments feedback leave them in the question in the comment section here on youtube or at sensibly speaking.com uh, I would like to hear from you. I'd like to know what you have to say about all of this. And I'm sure that when this posts, I will uh, be alerting Andy. So if you all have any questions or comments for him, you will find the link to his channel in the description and show notes on this uh, channel here and to that document you were talking about with Lifton's eight points. We will get that down there as well. Um, so we will see you guys next week. Bye-bye, everybody.